All right, everyone. Uh, hopefully, we're live. Uh, I'm just checking the Odyssey to double check. Um, yeah, it looks like we're okay. Yeah, we're live. So I'm here with Richard Spencer and Joel Davis. This is the uh, much hyped debate. It's one I've wanted to see myself for a while, actually, because I think um, these are probably the the best possible people for these respective positions. So it should be a good one. Um, so yeah, we're going to be debating empire versus nationalism. Obviously, Joel will be for nationalism. Richard Spencer is for empire. Uh, we will be taking super chats later in the show. Um, I'll try and get to the Odyssey ones. And obviously, the, the best platform to use is Entropy. There's a link in the description. And um, yeah, fair warning. And I actually uh, I had a migraine like all day today. So I've been going between my bed and, and vomiting right up until this started. So I, I may not be firing on uh, on all cylinders. So. Uh, no super chats asking me for like a, a hundred book reading list or something you can just direct them at, uh, at richard and joel um but yeah i think we can start with an open statement um we didn't talk about who goes first but i know richard you had something prepared so i'm sure joel will be fine with you making your case and responding sure yeah uh thank you for inviting me and thank you uh keith and thank you joel for uh participating uh so i think it's a good a good place to start would be what is on everyone's mind right now, and that is the Russia and Ukraine situation. Uh, now, of course, nationalism and or nationalisms play in interesting and complicated roles in this crisis tragedy that we're seeing. But when the rubber hits the road, it is ultimately a issue of empire. And one of my central theses this evening is that empire is in effect unavoidable and that nationalisms play a role as a kind of pawn within a larger imperial game. So at some point you have to confront that issue of empire and how, how we can define it. Um, now, what do I mean by this? Why is this an imperial um, question in Russia versus Ukraine. Use this as an example that ho hopefully can enlighten some bigger issues that are going to be discussed tonight. Um, well, uh, it isn't just a case of a plucky Ukraine that wants to be a nation state that's being attacked by a rival. Um, it is we are we have re-entered a 20th century game of big imperial powers in what is might actually end up to be a bifurcated world. That is, it's not just simply a case of should Ukrainians be nationalistic or or can they be nationalistic? Um, but it's a case of will they join what is ultimately a kind of postmodern imperial alliance like NATO? Or will they look towards Russia and join a, a kind of postmodern version of the Warsaw Pact or a postmodern version of the Soviet Union or the um, Russian Empire? Which way are they going to go? That was ultimately the question in 2014, which set off this whole affair. Um, whether they were going to look towards the EU and ultimately NATO or whether they were going to look towards the Russian economic system. Uh, there are many factors in this. It's a complicated matter, but it is ultimately a question of empire. And even when you look at some of the nationalisms that have erupted over this past week in relation to this event, they too are articulated through empire. Uh, there have been amazing scenes of Europeans gathering together in, in Paris and Lisbon and elsewhere, um, demanding, uh, in some cases, in the case of Sweden and, and, and uh, Estonia, demanding to join NATO, talking about being part of Europe. In other words, all of their you know, more personal, more local identities are ultimately articulated through empire. And empire is at the end of the day, ineluctable. Um, so why is this? Well, I, I think it would be a good idea to properly define nationalism. And in this way, I am going to talk about nationalism in terms of facts and feelings. 
uh, to uh, bring up that famous uh, Ben Shapiro expression. But I guess unlike Ben Shapiro, I care about both facts and feelings in this case. Uh, let's talk about the feelings um, first. Uh, I think it's safe to say that everyone is a nationalist about something. Uh, everyone feels some kind of deep, unconscious, irrational, you could say, pull towards some kind of homeland, some kind of high mod. Maybe that's your local town. Maybe that's your favorite football team. Maybe that's your city. Maybe that's your government. There's something, there's some place where you feel at home. Um, now, nationalism more traditionally has been defined ethnically, not, not exactly racially, but kind of a, a race within a race, a, a ethnicity. And I think it's probably more often defined uh, linguistically or regionally. Um, and in this case, it, I, I think nationalism in, in that feelings type definition is something that's both too big and too small very often. Um, when someone in America waves uh, an American flag, are they really thinking about the United States imperial, you know, you know, a uh, uh, boondoggle in Iraq or something? Or are they really even thinking about the government or even the whole country? I think they're probably thinking about their own town when that flag, that's how it resonates for them, that, that us-ness quality. That's how it works. Um, so in some ways, nationalism can be too big. I think in some ways, nationalism can be too small. One of the most remarkable things, as I mentioned, that we've seen in relation to the Ukraine crisis uh, has been a, a kind of European awakening, Europeans going to the center of their town, um, waving an EU flag, something that was almost unimaginable well, not too long ago, certainly within my lifetime. Um, it, there's been a, the, the, the rate of intermarriage of travel and communication of English as a lingua franca has brought Europe together in a remarkable way to the degree that which a, a country, you know, a, a borderland or a border, a, a nation state like Austria doesn't really cut it. It doesn't actually speak to the larger sense of us that is emerging. And I do, and I would say that in these identitarian circles, that they are often concentric circles. Everyone's from someplace. Everyone loves this or that sports team. Everyone cares about their family first, obviously. Uh, but there is a larger and broader sense of usness. Now, let's also talk to, to bring this to a close about the fact of nationalism. That is, what is it exactly, um, factually speaking? What does it mean to be a nation that, say, a member of the United Nations, uh, a member of good standing in the world community? It basically means that there is a locality that's defined in some manner. It has borders. Uh, it makes sovereign decisions. That is, um, it is not just simply a puppet state. Um, and uh, most likely, and increasingly likely, that it is a kind of parliamentary democracy where there is some kind of head of state, some kind of representative body that is going to make uh, sovereign decisions. Now, where does that entity come from? Uh, in my view, that entity is actually a fairly recent invention in terms of world history. Uh, a turning point in this respect is the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, which came uh, immediately after the Great War, the tumult and destruction uh, of the First World War, which was largely a, a kind of imperial shaking up. It resulted not only in millions of deaths, but it resulted in the abdication it was abdication of many royal families. It, it resulted in Bolshevism. It resulted in a, a question of how we're going to create a world order. Now, in the Paris Peace Conference, certainly one option 
for a world order was offered in Russia. It was Bolshevism. It was a, a kind of new Marxist order. Uh, the, uh, the end of history, uh, circa 1919, as opposed to circa 1991. Woodrow Wilson, the United States, offered a different vision, and that vision was self-determination. So in the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, which again is not very often remembered, we remember the first treaty was connected to it, we don't remember the whole thing. Uh, new nations were created. Poland was reinvented. Yugoslavia was invented. A mandate for a Jewish homeland in Palestine was set down on paper at that event. It was basically a, a sense of we are going to create new nation states. We're going to create buffer zones um, around Germany, and we're going to t and obviously take away what were formerly parts of the greater Germany, the German Empire. Um, we are going to use national self-determination as a paradigm for a world order. Now, what was this? This was, a, in effect, an attempt at neutralization. And neutralization, particularly, of competing powers to that world order, including the Bolshevism, which was off in the distance, but ever-present in everyone's mind. In other words, the creation of this idea of a nation state is to create an entity that is so weak that it can't ultimately challenge a larger planetary paradigm of empire. That is, the U.S. wanted to create a nation like Poland, recreate it in, that, in this sense, or create it almost out of whole cloth like Yugoslavia, as a way of creating this democratic, in, in more than one sense of the word, body that could function within its imperial sphere. It's an effort at neutralization, in other words. This dream of nationalism for everyone, of happy homelands, of you know every people a parliament, or however you want to articulate it, is ultimately a vision of global neutralization. That is the creation of all of these little interlocking nation states that have ultimately not enough power to challenge the inevitable global order that sets that down. The U.S., for better and for worse, has created a global system. It attempted to create that in 1919. It successfully created that in 1944 and 1945 with the dollar system, the United Nations, NATO, etc. Any form of national promotion in this sense is ultimately a form of neutralization. That is, it is a pawn on the board in someone else's empire. Thus, if we're even to talk about nationalism, not the feelings part, which I totally understand and think is an aspect of human nature, but the fact part of nationalism, you ultimately have to confront the reality of empire. That is, who sets the tone for the planet? Now, for uh, the first half of my lifetime, it, there was a bifurcated world with the Soviet Union and the United States setting the tone for the planet. Second half of my lifetime, it was a, a kind of unipolar world. We might be entering a new space in this sense. But what that space is, is always going to be an imperial and geopolitical question. And nationalism simply functions within that as a neutralized pawn. Uh, so I, I think that's enough. I, th I think we can, um, uh, uh, that can sum it up. But basically, nationalism is real. I respect it. Imperialism of some kind is ineluctable and it is inevitable. Okay, I'll just jump in. So uh, I guess I'll start with in the abstract and try and move closer and closer towards the concrete. So the way I would define nationalism is that nationalism is the identity of the governed with their government. Uh, this question of identity is like the essence of nationalism. Um, and the way I would define imperialism is the domination of a, a people by a... a uh, governing force, which they don't identify with and does not identify with them. So 
there's a hard distinction uh, between these two things. In my view, your uh, definition of imperialism seems to be uh, whoever sets the tone for the international system, whoever sets the tone for global politics, um, they're an imperial power. Now, I would dispute this because I think there's an important distinction between domination and leadership. And these two things are not necessarily the same thing. Um, now, un but undoubtedly, uh, the United States is an empire. But what kind of empire it is is very important because American imperialism was a new kind of imperialism uh, that we're living under now that was radically different than the imperialism of you know the British Empire, the French Empire, etc., and it actively destroyed those empires in the you know the post uh, World War II reorganization of the world. And uh, but fundamentally, though, American imperialism is uh, financial. So the American state uh, and its people they play a role, obviously, because they you know have the military force, they you know, have a political class, that you know, the State Department, the CIA, and so forth that in enforce this across the system. But ultimately, they are serving capitalist masters fundamentally. That's how it works. The average American uh, isn't really benefiting, I would say, from the American empire. In fact, the average American, I would argue, has increasingly had the opposite. I mean, maybe, you know, in the, in the kind of shake up after World War II, there was a certain benefit because America was exporting heaps of uh, products to overseas markets, and this caused economic boom, baby boom, etc. Um, but from the 70s onwards, the so-called what people generally refer to as the neoliberal period, which is like the last 50 years, um, we've seen the opposite. Like if you look at, uh, you know, just like the economic situation in the United States, we have increasing financialization. So this has been to the benefit of what I would call the rentier financial class, the parasites to the benefit of Wall Street that uh, actually run the show that pay for the Council on Foreign Relations and set American foreign policy in collaboration with, I guess, Zog elements, you could say, um, who have a, a bit of a different agenda. Um, but fundamentally, the empire serves them. Um, it does not serve, you know, the average American uh, at all, which is why Trump got elected, um, because fundamentally it had to be industrialized. You mentioned, um, you know, unipolarity. My impression uh, of the world is that unipolarity was an illusion. In, during the Cold War, obviously, it was bipolar. Uh, and in order to win the Cold War, the Americans had to align with the Chinese. And this meant that they had to deindustrialize and enable Chinese industrialization, which is the basis of the economic power of the newly forming Eastern Bloc. Basically, we're seeing a Cold War rematch, the same teams, roughly speaking, as last time with a few you know, fringe elements maybe swapped onto the other team. And I think the Americans are going to lose this time, definitely. I, I, I don't believe they have any capacity to win, fundamentally because they indeed deindustrialized. And uh, because now China controls global industry, they have uh, the capacity ultimately to win at the game that the American, in, in a similar way to how the Americans uh, were basically the economic powerhouse of the world. After World War II, America was 50% of the world economy. They built everything, everyone bought right. their products. Um, now, China is the industrial powerhouse because China doesn't have a parasitical financial rentier class running it. It has a managerial class. And that managerial class identifies with the Chinese people. It is, it is a nationalist state, in my view. Um, and so that means that Chinese policy and the kind of direction of Chinese politics is radically different than American politics because the American politics is driven to the benefits of its ruling parasitic financial class. Chinese politics isn't. And that means China can make decisions that are for the benefit of economic development, uh, whereas the Americans can't. So I listened to the State of the Union the other night where, you know, Biden started, it sounded as though he was stealing half of Trump's policies in his State of the Union. It was yeah. pretty funny. Um, and he was saying, you know, we're going to reindustrialize because this is basically what would Fund be the police. If, yeah. if you're going. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're going to if you're going to win Cold War Two, America has to become again an industrial powerhouse in order to you know actually have this uh, military competition the reason why the americans won cold war one was because of economics fundamentally um they broke the soviet union the soviet union couldn't maintain i mean there was there was multiple other reasons it wasn't just this structural dynamic but fundamentally um 
the kind of mismatch of the two economies broke the Soviet Union. Right. Um, this time, it's the opposite way around. And the Americans don't have the capacity to fix this unless they overthrow Wall Street, unless they overthrow the uh, the parasitical financial rentier class that actually run America um, and start reindustrializing the economy, which would mean uh, not directing it towards financialization. What do I mean by this? So in China, the government directly invests in industry and invests in infrastructure because the Chinese want to develop their real economy. In the United States, there is basically no real economic growth, and there hasn't been for 50 years. It's been the opposite. It makes less stuff. Um, it's, it, it's, its industrial base is depleted. Its middle class is depleted. Everyone is in massive amounts of debt, whether you're looking at the government or individuals. Um, but of course, this is it's designed this way for a reason, because the, you know, the so-called fire economy, you know, uh, you know finance, insurance, uh, rent, uh, I can't remember what the E stands for, but it doesn't matter. Basically, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a kind of rent collection. Really system. So there's a whole bunch of non-productive um, financial dynamics that are at play in the American system. And it's all about this uh, class interest of the capitalist class uh, as opposed to the national interest. So going back to what I said before, what is imperialism? Imperialism is the domination of a governed people by a government they do not identify with. And I would argue this is what America is, and this is what the states that kind of exist underneath its purview ultimately are. They are dominated by this class that they don't identify with, and, and, do, and it does not identify with them. Whereas they're going, to, it's going to lose, in my view, against the Chinese and their bloc, because they don't run on the same logic. Now, this is important because you made this larger point about you know, geopolitics and like the structure of the international system, obviously being some kind of petty, romantic nationalist that is only concerned about, if I was only concerned just about Australia, for example, that would be kind of silly because Australia exists in complex relationships with all other countries, uh, with, with various other countries in the world. And obviously the most powerful countries in the world, the relationships you have with them are more important than less powerful countries. So this matters. Um, but this doesn't really refute nationalism in my view, because um, nationalism fundamentally, as I said before, is about this identity between the governed and uh, the government. And so if you have an international system where the most powerful countries are interested in leadership, but not necessarily domination, where they basically want to be secure. So they want secure peers who aren't going to um, work against them in any kind of, uh, you know, threaten their security. Um, that are happy to kind of cooperate with them with a certain economic logic, um, you know, trade with them and so forth in a, in, a, in a kind of peaceful, mutually beneficial manner, there would be no reason for them to just start dominating countries. Like just start, like the Chinese, why would they invade Australia and just start trying to you know, overthrow our government or invade the entire world and set up some global Chinese imperial architecture when they can just run their country very, uh, very competently and then just sell their products to a bunch of other countries uh, that are quite happy to buy them, uh, that want to have peaceful relations with them. It's far cheaper and easier to do this. So it's possible to imagine, in principle, an international system that isn't based upon domination if it doesn't have this uh, parasitic rentier class running the show. So what you have with empires is this particular kind of class structure that drives the internal political system. And in my, in my view, the kind of managerial nationalism that has been achieved in the Chinese state refutes this. It says that there's another way of organizing the world or organizing politics and organizing government, which doesn't have, um, you know, that doesn't work for capitalist interest or aristocratic feudal interests, but instead works for the national interest. And so in this sense, I think nationalism is inevitable because they're gonna win the Cold War or the second Cold War and they're going to therefore become the de facto leaders of the international system. And, you know, you know, the world didn't just become, uh, didn't just copy the European state model because the European state model was imposed upon them. A lot of countries copied the European state model because it worked better than the model that they had. So if you're a country and you want the best for your people, you look to the most powerful and successful countries in the world and go, well, we'll try what they're doing because right. clearly they have the most advanced ideas. They have the best technologies, the best you know, uh, social and political ideas. Otherwise, they wouldn't be so much more powerful and prosperous than us. So in my view, a state like China completely destroys the entire logic of American imperialism because it shows that going a completely different direction 
um, and like removing this parasitical financial class off your back enables you to develop your country in a way that's far more um, beneficial to it as a whole and to its like, collective power um, than, you know, being part of, uh, you know, being under American hegemony. Now, obviously, there's China was able to do this because it has a massive population. The Americans contemplated nuking China in the early 50s. They chose against it. They'd be too difficult to invade. So they kind of had to take the L and they had to cooperate with them to win the first Cold War, as I said earlier. So the Chinese were able to kind of game the system. But because the Chinese have gamed the system, now the system can't, can no longer function. Now the entire logic of American imperialism has to be upended, whether it's by choice, which I'm skeptical of, frankly, of the Americans radically reorganizing their society to replicate the Chinese economic model, which, by the way, they copied off the Germans and the Americans themselves. Um, yeah. Or um, they lose the Cold War, or Cold War II, and they fracture and collapse, and what will rise in their place will be developmental nationalisms, in my view. Just like the Soviet Union collapsed, nationalisms emerge. Um, what we have seen in the 20th century is the kind of proliferation of nationalism. Why is this? Uh, I, I I'll give you a chance to respond to what I've already said, but I have some more to say on that as well. Well, I mean, I'm afraid, Joel, that I vehemently agree with so much of what you said. <laughs> so I, I think the, the good thing about this is that this could be a uh, productive discussion, uh, but might not be the uh, hot uh, throwdown debate BTFO session um, that maybe uh, the audience was hoping for. Um, my my argument effectively, and, and I will stand by my argument, is that na imperialism of some kind is unavoidable. There are, there are periods of imperialism. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of violent conquering Bronze Age imperialism. I, I think we are largely um, out of that realm. And I actually don't dispute your description of the United States empire uh, in, in ways in which it's greatest virtue is also its Achilles heel and is going to bring it down. And that this is kind of the, the passing of the torch in history, the decline and fall of things. I agree with you. And I, I might, I might push back a little bit on the United States is going to lose the cold war 2.0, but, and I, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that, but I actually agree with a lot of your assessment. Um, of what you're saying. My argument is, is simply that nationalism is an aspect of human nature that I don't deny. Um, the nation state is, in effect, an attempt to neutralize certain bodies within a, a global empire. But the fact is, the, the notion that you know the Chinese might have a better model for doing this, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, et cetera, I've recently read about that, um, I'm open to these ideas. I'm open to the idea that the United States has had its day in the sun and might very well be uh, facing its ultimate comeuppance. I'm open to that concept. I think that needs to be explored. I'm also open to the concept that um, unipol the unipolarity of the past 30 years, the, 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 the kind of neoliberal order on steroids, you know, post-Reagan and Thatcher, there's no more Soviet Union to as a competition. There's no other model. End of history. Uh, that that is in a way coming to an end, and that if the United States is going to survive, it might very well, and the Western world, it might very well need to be investing in all of these things that it divested itself of over the past thirty years. That is real industry here, natural resources. The United States has never quite gotten away from that. Uh, nuclear power. Uh, a kind of definancialization of, I, I mean, I, I am open to all of those things. And in fact, I might give you a high five if that is what you are <laughs> recommending uh, for my country. Um, my point, I guess, is uh, more theoretical that someone is going to have to set the tone. One uh, you know, counter argument you can make that China is just going to win Cold War 2.0. Okay, now that's Correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems to be built on a, an assumption that Russia, which is now remarkably totally cut off from the West economically, or, or, or 90 percent, 
massive sanctions like we've never seen. Um, that and uh, Nord Stream, Nord Stream Two, are now gone. It's not uh, Russia is not going to be providing fifty percent of the natural gas to Germany. It might start pointing that those na those hydrocarbon resources towards China. Is that actually what? Do you think that might very well happen? It's Just already to... been announced. It's already okay. signed. Okay. Uh, and so the real Cold War is going to be kind of an east-west of um, the U.S. versus China. And what you're saying is that China will ultimately win this one. It has a better, better model. Yeah, but I don't, I don't mean that the Chinese I might very will well agree America. with you. Because like this is why I think Unipol and John Mearsheimer makes this argument in the tragedy of great power politics, which if you haven't read, I highly recommend to anyone. Yeah, listening. I love Mearsheimer. I actually took a course from him. Yeah, he's a he's a great intellectual, and um, mm -hmm. he makes the point that you know global domination in a military sense is kind of fundamentally impossible, at least under current military technology, because of the problems of power projection across oceans. This is why the Americans. If America had a land border with China, they probably could have invaded China and got away with it in the 50s. But because of the ocean between the United States and China, a kind of occupation was just logistically very difficult because he makes the argument that ultimately, you know, obviously you have four main categories, in, you know, land, sea, land, land uh, forces, sea forces, air forces, nu nuclear forces, um, and, you know, you know, the air force and the navy and the and nukes can all like, obviously all have very important strategic functions, but land right. power is where the rubber hits the road. You need, you know, if you want to actually maintain sovereignty over a long period, and that's logistically very, very difficult to maintain, um, you know, if you've got oceans between you. This is why, you know, Britain wasn't invaded in, you know, by the Germans in World War II, because if, if it was a land border between Britain and, uh, you know, and, and Europe, Britain would have fallen, you know, even maybe even faster than the French fell. Right. So, the the point that he makes is that therefore the best you can kind of hope for is uh, as a great power is to kind of be the big dog in your region where no one can fuck with you. It's like as an American, I don't go to sleep at night worrying about the Canadians or the Mexicans invading America <coughs> because that would be no. suicide. Um, right. So you know Monroe Doctrine, whatever. But but then what the next best thing you can do to maintain your security, according to his kind of offensive realist analysis is try to prevent in the other two zones where great powers could emerge, Europe and China, from an American perspective, um, a great power to form and dominate those regions. Then you have a peer competitor. And that's obviously, you know, the the kind of Cold War dynamic, World War II, even World War One to an extent, um, yeah. demonstrated this. So his point then is, uh, you know, the best thing you can then therefore hope for is maybe to kind of you know build alliances with you know with like kind of balancing coalitions like the Amer like you know that's what nato is and that's what the americans are yeah. trying to do with the quad uh in east asia um but i wouldn't say this is necessarily imperialism i would say what this is is um cooperation so it is true that nato's presence in europe facilitates um the American political class and its and its and its uh, you know financial elite to dominate European markets and dominate European politics, um, and because it has that leverage, but it isn't necessarily it wouldn't necessarily have to be this way if the American political class wasn't so batshit insane with you know their libtard ideas and it wasn't run by Wall Street, but they had a competent managerial elite, NATO could end up being an alliance that was based on friendship rather than domination. It doesn't have to be do a, a relationship of domination in principle. Well, let me push back a little bit on that. Um, I, I think that definitely, again, I'm, I'm finding a lot of um, areas of agreement. I, I think we might be arguing semantics, but um, that that's fine by me. I mean, I, 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 uh, I'm learning and, and, and listening by what you're saying. Uh, but, yeah, in terms of NATO, I mean, I, I could agree with that when basically Europe is in rubble and the United States was actively intervening in political parties and elections to basically make sure that there was a kind of center left and center right, social democratic and centrum kind of Catholic right wing parties in, in, in these various countries to in effect neutralize them. And that it, it was a form of domination, but maybe a, a velvet domination. A lot of soft power was in play, and in some ways, Europe didn't have any choice. Um, 
again, that was 70 years ago. I mean, we, we're in a different world right now. And I, you know, NATO, I, I think NATO is a anti-Russian alliance that is voluntary on some level. I, I don't deny the power dynamic at play, of course. Um, we now see mass demonstrations enthused about joining NATO and about how we need to get Ukraine in NATO. Uh, whether that's a good idea, I won't. I, I won't endorse that one. But um, let's be a part of NATO. Let's be in this together. It seems a. I, I think it's wrong to underestimate the consensual basis of this alliance. And secondly, it's underest it's it's wrong to underestimate how these power trajectories can change. There is uh, Germany is rearming in a remarkable way. It is supplying lethal weapons to Ukraine. It is what was it doubling its military budget. It did this overnight like a snap to enthusiastic applause remarkably, of France and other countries, uh, a situation that was just unimaginable in the, um, uh, even up to, to the 2000s. Uh, I mean, Mar Mar Margaret Thatcher was very worried about a reunified uh, Germany because she thought a new Fourth Reich would emerge. Uh, certainly, if Germany started rearming after this Second World War, um, the French would uh, start rattling their sabers. Uh, but we now have a kind of new power dynamic at play in NATO. And I don't think it's wrong to suggest that NATO could kind of almost evolve into a European Union fighting force. That is a force that is not un-American uh, or, or certainly not anti-American, but actually is a more of a primary, primarily European force. I, in terms of a managerial elite that is more competent than our, you know, totally insane, woke, tarred ruling class, uh, I think you can find that to a large degree in Europe. Uh, and I think all of these things are a good thing. Uh, my, so, I mean... Well, my, my argument, though, is that it, it is... It, let's say you have we have got Cold War II, so it's in the interests, structurally, for the Americans for there to be a strong Europe. Because yeah. if you have a weak Europe, um, that's going to be difficult to check, uh, you know, just like it's in the interest for China to have a strong Russia. China doesn't want to dominate the Russians. China wants a strong Russia because it needs to have good partners in its bloc mm -hmm. in the same way that the Americans do. But this is a structural contradiction with, with the American empire itself, because the American yeah. empire itself exists to facilitate Wall Street rent extraction. So that means it has to exploit the people that are part of its block. It has to deindustrialize them. It has to financialize their economies. It has to make them um, dependent. Um, and so this contradiction means that one of these things, uh, either the Americans lose the Cold War because because they just keep parasitizing their own allies, or you need a, a reorganization of European and North American uh, politics, which would be something like a developmental nationalism. Which would I mean multiple nationalisms? Like a, a kind I of feel country. like if I can get in here, I mean I think uh, while we're discussing kind of the direction of uh, what you're calling Cold War Two, there probably will be a lot of agreement between you. But I mean, I guess the the more important question is what will the order look like after that, and what should it look like? Because I think even if you two agreed on all of the uh, is predictions, there still be a disagreement on the odd. Obviously, I mean I think Spencer doesn't think that nationalism would be desirable even if it were possible you know the uh homeland for everyone type vision but i mean there's a question for you joel um i mean you're kind of implying this in your argument but you seem to be implicitly suggesting that um you know were china to win cold war ii um that you're not going to see them revert to like standard modes of imperial domination but i mean a lot of people would say that um some of the things in belt and road um, and some of the projects are doing in Africa and so on. It's just a new form of imperialism. And I guess the question would be, um, you know, if China was to become um, the true hegemon, you know, what would be to what would be there to stop them from exploiting these smaller nations? Well, it's because of the way that the Chinese socioeconomic structure is, 
um, like the the logic of domination just isn't replicated as it is in in the United States because China is not interested in making a bunch of Chinese capitalists super rich as its fundamental raison d'etre. China is okay. fundamentally and has accomplished that. <laughs> no, I mean, of course, it's a mixed economy, and so you want people to do well, but it's fundam it's structurally different than the United States, right? So. The Chinese national interest comes first, and then it's in China's national interest to raise some billionaires, so they do so. Whereas in the United States, the interests of the billionaires come first, and it's in the interest of the billionaires for America to sometimes act in its national interest, so it sometimes does. And this is the fundamental distinction between um, but, the I logic. Mean, by, by the same logic, couldn't be in, it couldn't be in Chinese national interest to exploit the nation of the Congo or whatever for the benefit of China. And then that's that's an imperialism not for the capitalist class, but it's for the Chinese state. Yeah. Um so what? Like do you think China what what, what does it want to, what does it want from the Congo? Because um Minerals. the logic of American imperialism. <laughs> Maybe labor even? I mean well, yeah, okay. Let me, is, let this, me is, is this really bad for the Congo if the Chinese come in and build a wow. whole bunch of infrastructure? Um, and they try and encourage a local managerial elite to form that, that you know, they, they buy a bunch of Chinese weapons. This is not really a relationship of domination. It's a relationship of assisted development. And the Chinese want to profit from it, but also the people of Congo can profit from it. It's, uh, to me, okay. this seems like a fundamentally different relationship than a, than a kind of domineering imperial relationship that's like the neoliberal world where the IMF and the World Bank come in and, and basically force you to not develop so that they can like kind of uh, maintain their rent extraction. Well, did they do that to Germany? I mean, it, G Germany was the big loser in the Second World War. Is is Germany just undeveloped? I mean, I I think you you almost sound like a kind of leftist uh, telling this story about how this is all a big scam to just impoverish everyone and so on, and that that clearly has not happened. Um, in high IQ countries, to be to be honest, but l let me back up a little bit. Um, so I, I think what this what the the sticking point seems to be here uh, about like U.S. financial imperialism, and I actually agree with so many of your critiques. I mean, I hope that my country. I'm in the West. I'm in the United States. I ain't leaving. I hope my country actually does have a capacity to change. I hope we have a more enlightened and a less woke tarted and financialized and, and kind of evil managerial class. I mean, I, I certainly hope that. Now, might we lose this upcoming battle? That might very well be in the cards. Um, but you seem to be just making this argument for China. And uh, to be honest, so this is a kind of like China good, US imperialism bad kind of argument and i i feel like some kind of pushback uh needs to to happen here i mean first off china has absolutely benefited from the american system and it's actually as you yourself acknowledge it, it as, as you described it, it kind of gamed the system and so from the mid 90s on we had i mean if we go back to the 70s we had nixon and the outreach to china kind of geopolitical split of the communist sphere and so on. We fast forward to the mid nineties, there's the uh, or origination of this kind of chimerica arrangement. And you know, your iPhone is designed in California, made in China and sold in America. And so you have this system where China buys a lot of debt, they're buying uh, US debt, they're kind of financing consumption at some level, financing government expenditures, although that's lessened recently they get the manufacturing industry and united states gets to kind of design it in this cool you know uh studio like uh corporate environment and they get to consume it at walmart um now whether that has there's a that's a huge mixed bag from my perspective in terms of whether that's benefited the, the the American people. The American people have, after all, been able to consume Chinese-made goods from, you know, uh, plastic toys to iPhones, 
et cetera. They have benefited from that. Now, are there a lot of bad things, deindustrialization, hollowing out of the middle class that have gone along with that? Yes. Do do I personally want us to move away from that system? Yes. Uh, can China, does China have the vision and the ability to move away from Chimerica? Despite all of the hot rhetoric about, you know, anti-China rhetoric coming from the Republican Party um, and a kind of neo-Cold War, uh, it, does is China able to move away from the Chimerica system? Well, well you yes. might say yes. I say, yeah, I would I'll say to you how. remains to be seen. But it's um, uh, the structural logic of what's been happening is the, the way that the Americans, as you mentioned, the Chi America relationship was the Chinese are developing. So that means that there's a lot of cheap labor in China, right? Right. And so therefore, it makes sense for American companies to and Western companies to manufacture shit in China rather than in America, where they have to pay right. way higher wages. Now, the Chinese have, have used this to develop their country and build their own middle class. Um, that will become, it's becoming a larger and larger consumption market. And so in so doing, and they've also started to develop high tech uh, capital intensive industries, which is obviously what the Americans used to dominate. And the Chinese are making gains across the board on all these industries. And now they're using Belt and Road to develop a whole bunch of other part of the world, Africa, Eurasia, et cetera, so that they can move their cheap labor jobs to there and they could become right. the capital intensive. But the difference is, is that this was not in America's interest because they just created for themselves an enemy that now they can't defeat. So it was really stupid by the Americans. It was based, and that was, and that's how you understand that that the American empire is not run on the logic of what's in America's national interest. It's run on the logic of what's in the short-term interests of a bunch of capitalist parasites. Whereas the Chinese, well, I, I agree with you. I I might. I, I think you might be overstating matters, but I, I think you're making absolutely valid critiques of the U.S. empire. I mean, I my my argument was simply that, you know, someone setting the tone. I mean, someone set the tone for the Chimerica arrangement to arise. That was a policy choice made by Nixon and Kissinger, among other people. Um, that was a, a kind of monetary choice made in 1944 with the Bretton Woods. That is a military arrangement in the sense that someone is going to open up these shipping ways so that these products can go to and fro continents. So it, there, you can't escape some kind of imperial arrangement. Now, again, if you are arguing that the goose is cooked for the U.S. empire and there are a lot of terrible people uh, you know, capitalist parasites involved with the U.S. empire. I mean, I, I, I'm a, I, ha, I, I can only be honest. I have to agree with you. I'm not going to argue against that for argument's sake. I deeply hope that things are going to change. But I do, do sense a bit of kind of propaganda-like pro-China stuff coming from I'm, your I, argument. I'm and I think Keith, I, if, I, if I can get Keith, in, I mean... Okay, Keith was gesturing towards this. The notion that the Chinese are these just wonderful people. It's not about uh, them being who, wonderful. Who, it's about them having different structural interests because they aren't. Okay, but well, the idea like the... that they aren't going to exploit people or that they have the the kind of national interest of other people at, or they'll, they'll respect those national interests more than the U.S. Uh, I, I no, think it's I'm one of those devil you know type, type situations. Russia, Russia moving from shipping its hydrocarbons to Central Europe, moving towards shipping, shipping those to China. There's the devil you know and the devil you don't know. The, the degree you might say that China is going to respect Russia. It's not going to conquer them. It's not going to do things to them. That remains to be seen. And the notion that the Chinese are just I, I don't. I know you're not saying that they're good or more moral or something like that, but there's just some kind of better relationship that we're going to have with the Chinese. Um, sometimes you've got to just trust your gut on this, Joel. <laughs> and I don't think we're going to have a good your, relationship with them. If you're, if you ask your average American, <laughs> would you rather live under like woke American imperialism, like your average American and you know, Oklahoma, would you rather live under kind of woke American imperialism or be a part of a Chinese manufacturing system? Uh, they would start dyeing their hair blue in a matter of seconds. Uh, be well, look, careful I mean, I'm not saying that for. we join the Chinese system. I'm saying that we, okay. 
we we say, hmm, you guys are doing it better than us, and we want to compete with you, so we're going to copy your good ideas. We're going to reorganize and imitate you. Yeah, but just okay. be in that agreement. In, I mean, there's I'm in the a thing is, agreement. the thing is, we're, no one's going to disagree. I think on the criticisms of American financial empire, but I mean, I feel like as long as we're arguing around, um, you know, what China is or what it could be, I mean, that can go either way because at the same time, China, if it chose to could become imperialist uh, in that model and choose to dominate it. So if we're going to argue about like where the Chinese leadership class is morally on that question, I mean, that's not going to settle anything in the debate. No one watching this is going to change their mind on if well, nationalism often, is good based on... But often people misunderstand what I'm saying as saying like I'm pro-China or something. I'm not. I'm pro... What the what, I'm. Look at me. I'm not Chinese. All right? I'm pro... I, mean, I think, I think America, the question... I'm pro Europe. I mean, the I'm more interesting Australia. question is... It's important that we respect whose side is history on. Like, yeah, but it's important that we respect when our enemy is doing something better than us. If we don't want to lose, and we're going I to totally lose, agree. Listen... this is a very productive debate. I totally hmm. agree with that. What you just said there, Joel. Yeah. Okay. But again, this this is what I think that there's a problem in this, and that um, you know, Joel, your recommendations for the state, Richard could just apply that to his imperial state. So I mean, I think the more interesting question is. Whose side is history on in terms of, you know, Richard talked about the modern nation state being a creation of uh, the early 20th century. I guess the question is, you know, is there a process of sort of um, unending devolution that you see happening uh, that's going to enshrine the nation state in a way it never was before? Or, um, Richard, do you think that there's sort of structural forces going the opposite way? I, mean, I think that's more interesting discussion than, you know, where the Chinese leadership class um, where they desire things to go, because again, that can easily change. Yeah. Um, well, I, you, I don't. See, you can take this, Joel. I've I've, yeah. I've spoken mostly. Yeah. Well, my argument is that if you're a if you have a a managerial elite as opposed to a capitalist elite, um, your structural interests are fundamentally different than if you are a capitalist elite. It's sort of moral arguments necessarily, although there are moral arguments associated. I'm making a structural argument. So. In order for if you have a, if you're a manager elite running a territory, let's say I become Nazbol dictator of Australia tomorrow, not going to happen. But like it, it's a thought experiment. Is it in my interest to immediately get all of the productive resources of my society and start invading New Zealand, invading Indonesia, and trying to subjugate these people, or is it in my interest instead to build up the productive forces of my society so that I have all the h most high tech? Like I am the most developed society in the world and I have all the most high tech monopolies. And then I then go and try and enter into economic relationships with the countries around me then and use that, get them to do all the cheap labor while I sell them all the really expensive shit. That's what the Chinese are doing. They want to be, um, they, they want to economically benefit, but they're economically benefiting in a way that doesn't require them to destroy the development of other countries because other countries being more developed means that they have more money to buy Chinese shit. So they, okay, they have, we the get it. You like China. But let, let me answer Keith's question. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think they're very, uh, one could make an argument at the end of this American age that we're living through that there could be a lot of devolution and that in in some ways some of those questions that were on everyone's mind could could kind of go away that the, the question of uh nuclear warfare of geopolitics of globalization and so on that we could have a kind of devolution of that and a resurgence of of nationalism um i i think that is yeah. absolutely a possibility uh but i i see a lot of kind of wishful thinking when I hear people make these arguments that, you know, the American uh, system is going to collapse and that we're all just going to go back to the farm and uh, put on, you know, ceremonial dress and start dancing around maypoles and, you know, worshiping folk idols. And so there, there seems to be a kind of traditionalist or even primitivist fantasy going on when people talk well, about the collapse of these things. And I ultimately don't think that will happen. I think someone is going to set the tone. Um, now, who that is or, or what, what two or three entities that might be 
is the question. But we ultimately, we live in a society, we live on a planet, and there is going to be some kind of military and financial power that is going to set the tone for the planet. And these nationalisms are going to interact within that. Well, can, yeah, I, can I just put it to you? A... I mean, we've, we, we'd all say that uh, in some sense, you know, modernity was on the side of, of nationalism and that it gave birth to the modern nation state. Um, and there's this trend of like, you know, the example of nationalism and the idea of popular sovereignty resting among a nation that that has a certain power to it, right? Like after, you know, Irish independence, um, other sort of anti-colonial movements in India and so on were taking inspiration from that. That once that idea um, that alien rule is wrong spreads, it seems hard to undo that. You know, once that genie is out of the bottle, you can't really undo that. You can't really get Ukrainians right now to just go back to accepting uh, being ruled from Moscow. I mean, an example right now, I mean, you know, you have the, I think you have the Ukrainian flag in your bio on Twitter, but that's an example this week. I mean, you know, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in the 90s or, uh, you know, any of these kind of uh, 20th century imperial national nations, I don't think there would have been the same outcry. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I'd question to you, like, is it possible to put that genie back in the bottle? I mean, once you have um, this globalized system and you have means of communication, I mean, in some ways it can help imperialism, but in another way, it gives people more a sense of their identity. They're more aware of the other, other races, other national groups. They see other sort of national independence movements. Um, and it seems to me, you know, you almost have to have a model like the American empire where it's yeah. all done through um, kind of manufactured consent rather than coercion. This is kind of like the, it seems like the, the later phases of imperialism. Um, but once you've got to that point, can you ever go back to a more kind of coercive imperialism? Uh, possible. Um, I mean, it's a very good question, and I agree with a, a lot of what you've said. I mean, look, a lot of things are possible. I mean, we could we could go through hyperinflation and uh, you know shocking illiteracy rates, and we could re emerge in a kind of Bronze Age or something. I mean, all, all of those things are, are possible. I mean, the, the the question is is what is likely. And I, I think actually what you set out is uh extremely plausible uh in the sense that it's a it's a postmodern kind of late stage of imperialism that is setting the tone that interacts and in in some ways kind of emphasizes various identities and nationalism and, and often in kind of contradictory and complicated um ways but i think there's some also some countervailing forces um, that need to be mentioned. And, and I mentioned uh, some of these in my opening. Um, the degree to which uh, the Eurail system, the degree to which intermarriage, the degree to which the Erasmus program has sponsored Europeans, Germans going to Spain and um, impregnating and marrying Spanish girls and having a family, the degree to which business English, which operates as a kind of Latin or French, a neo a lingua, a lingua franca um, for the European continent. Um, yes, there, there, there are local senses of usness, but the degree to which Europeans are understanding ourselves as one people is very similar to the way in which uh, a lot of the ethnic divides uh, in the United States, particularly after immigration restriction in um, the 1920s, uh, really went away. And the kind of like wasp Irish dynamic, although it's uh, very intense between Keith and I, uh, for most people, uh, it's actually something that is in effect, you know, I, I, you know, I'm an Episcopalian or I drink green beer on St. Patrick's Day in, in the sense that it's purely fun. Or, 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 or ceremonial. It doesn't really have a play. Um, so I, I think these are complicated questions. I, I think what, what Keith said is very accurate, but there's this countervailing force, which Nietzsche recognized. I mean, I hate to fall into the stereotype here, but uh, Nietzsche recognized very vividly and uh, beyond good and evil of Europeans coming together. And there are forces that are pulling us away from that nationalist fervor and pushing us towards understanding ourselves as white people. 
Okay, but all that, all mean, that what you're, what you're talking about is, is Europe a nation, right? Am I the um, bank? It's still something that's happening in true consent, right? There's no imperial overlord enforcing this European identity on people. Yes, but it does. Butter right now. It's Keith versus Richard. Richard, <laughs> well, think? okay, that's fine. But uh, I, yes, Keith, it is largely consensual, consensual, but it everything exists within a context, and that Europeanization. You know, I think it, it. You can look at it in the 19th century. I mean, Nietzsche was talking about it in the uh, 1880s, but um, it, it exists within a kind of Americanized world in a way. As I said, business English acts as a kind of lingua franca. It exists in a post-war world where the notion of France attacking Germany or vice versa is, is basically unthinkable. Uh, it, it does exist in this kind of neoliberal world of instant communication and so on. So it is absolutely consensual, but everything that's consensual exists within a context. Like everything that's free exists within limits. And everything that's limited is, in a way, free. I mean, to be a bit what, Hegelian here, but Hegel's right. What you seem to be arguing, though, is you're arguing, in my view, what this sounds like is that Europe is emerging as a nation. That there's a European. Yeah. So that you're really not arguing for imperialism. You're arguing for a kind of nationalism, just like a higher. This is it's just a bigger nation. Just Supranationalism, of- which is a kind of. I mean, but I'm I'm specifically not arguing for devolution into the nation state as it was defined in 1919. I'm arguing for something like the EU and a bigger force. But I agree with your kind of ethical claim, I totally agree, of some kind of class, a managerial class that democratically, in a, in a deep sense of the word, represents the people. I obviously support that. Um, but I don't think that necessarily has to take place um, with, within the context of a nation as small as, say, Finland or something. Yeah, well, neither do I, because obviously identity has a subjective quality. Right. So if, if the, you're arguing basically that there is a kind of subjective convergence between different nation states within Europe into a kind of pan-European consciousness... To me, you're making a nationalist argument. You're not arguing that everyone should be dominated by the Germans and ruled by Berlin or something. Um, mm. I, I, down the <laughs> maybe I am. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, but that, that isn't what you're arguing. At, um, no, no. So, no. so I think uh, really you're a nationalist, not really an imperialist. Uh, that that's fair. I think we we're we're just getting into a semantic issue then. So this whole debate was a waste of time. I don't think it was a waste of time at all. Actually, I appreciate um, most of what you said. I, I push well, I mean, back there's in some still, ways. I mean, there's still a que- there's still a question. I mean, if then if what we're down to is kind of racial versus ethnic nationalism, I mean, Joel, I think you've defined yourself as an ethno nationalist. So I mean, yeah, clearly there, there are reasons that you would reject a racial nationalism. Well, it couldn't be just purely racial like that. Like there has to be a process of ethnogenesis. So if right. Richard is arguing that Europe can become an ethnicity, then and he's trying to make an ethnogenetic argument, then we can get into the bones of okay, well, how would that actually work? Um, but but that's a separate argument. But he, he's not just saying because we're all white people, we're all European. I don't think. I think he's he's making a different kind of argument. It's plausible. Yeah. I mean, Russians are also white, but they're not included in this, obviously. So it's not purely just a racial thing. Well, I, I hope they, they could be included in this. And I guess I, in that respect, I've done my part. Um, but um, I, I do think that very strong forces, um, Vladimir Putin among them, is going to prevent that. But yeah, I, I think ethnogenesis is a very good term uh, for what I was talking about, that it isn't just a kind of like bio purely biological saying you know oh there there's a there's a white race or there it's just based simply on skin color or something like that i think there actually has been a very strong ethnogenesis of a european people that has actually been happening for a long time and is increased tremendously um in the american age it's a kind of uh unintended probably unintended consequence of americanization is europe a nation yeah, well, I mean, that's it's kind of in a way just resetting to type in a sense. I mean, a thousand years ago, there was a bunch of tiny kingdoms within Christendom. And so it's just uh, to be just arguing it's taking a new form. Yeah. 
Yeah, we can go to super chats. Um, I mean, I, I'm skeptical if uh, if the European identity is is becoming as strong as you think. I mean, I don't think you'd get a majority probably in any European country that they say they would ent- identify as as European out of their nation state. And I mean, the the language thing. I mean, that is a trend with with nationalisms is you know, Irish and actually Ukrainian nationalisms are, are a good example that in the early formation of those nationalisms, the language was very much emphasized uh, to emphasize their otherness versus you know, the British or the Russians. Right. Um, but the trend you see is that even if the native language disappears, as largely has done in Ireland, uh, again, once that genie is out of the bottle, it's not like they lose the language and Irish people go back to identifying as British. So, you know, even if there's more of a homogenization process with language i'm not sure that necessarily points toward um a european identity or people well, i think intermarriage does yeah well i i was i watched your debate with haas and i thought haas made a good point that ultimately the european identity at the in its current form is just this kind of liberal universalism we are we believe in democracy and human rights and you know the typical you know cringe takes right so what would be needed in my view um, to have this ethnogenesis is a is a shared mythos, a shared sense of history that all Europeans would have to buy into. I don't um, like what did he call it? Like Reddit globalism or something? Is something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. I I, 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 I actually acknowledge. I acknowledge that that's a good critique. I I did. I I disagreed with. Well, maybe 90. if I if I can actually just read the first super check because it's actually okay. on this topic, so okay. it's a good way to include it. Uh, it's from Yehuda Finkelstein, uh, your old friend. He said, "Richard, why did you say I side with my country on JF's show? Isn't America irredeemable at this point? Like how the USSR was irredeemable in the 1980s? How is your position any different from bitter enders like the August 91 Soviet coup plotters who sought to preserve a decrepit USSR?" Uh, may, maybe that's what it is. But the fact is, I'm a U.S. citizen. I live in this country and I'm not a traitor and I am not going to actively attempt to subvert or undermine my nation. I just cannot do it. I'm not I mean, programmed what if the, in that manner. But, you know, you're, you're talking about European nationalism. You know, what if the, the interests of the U.S. nation state is in conflict with the European people? Uh, well, that doesn't seem to be the case at the moment. Um, but I agree that... Um, you know, the, these are complicated, conflicted ways. I, I would say this, um, first off, to, to, to I'll, I'll, let me say two things here. To, to go back a little bit, you were saying like, there's this, the critique that Haas made that I acknowledge was a good one, uh, which is that, oh yeah, you say you're all Europeans, but what does that even mean outside of cringe, you know? And um, that's a good one. But, you know, a good way to forge a people and a forge a national myth- mythos is a good old fashioned war <laughs> and the fear of death as something that's imminent uh even the not just death but annihilation nuclear annihilation that notion that we have to be encamped and we have to work together as a team to fight off something greater uh that is what is happening right now vladimir putin has seemingly ensured that that level of mortality salience of us versus them, they're going to kill us, is now in the air in Europe in a way that it wasn't 10 years ago. And that is a good thing. It's a great yeah. thing. I, I think Vladimir Putin is operating as, as, a, in the, as, as a con, the cunning of reason. Do, do you seriously think, though, that the Russians would attack a NATO member? Because that's insane to me. It will never I, I don't think that, but that's in the air. And Vladimir Putin has literally threatened as much, although vaguely. I mean, he, he said he threatened unim- retaliation if you get involved. Unimaginable consequences. I mean, when I hear that, w- when everyone hears that, they think mushroom clouds. Um, but, you know, look, I, I, we're all, I mean, as as Americans and as Europeans, I mean, we're, we're all in this kind of nihilistic downward spiral um, I, I don't deny this, but the the question is, do we just want to like throw our hands up and be like, oh, it's just irredeemable, fuck it, or something like that? Or, or do we want to at least look to positive signs that this kind of world can be transformed? I don't think we're going to see a collapse in the way that a lot of kind of right wingers see it. Like everything's just going to fall apart tomorrow morning. I don't think that. And I do think that there is at least a potential 
maybe I'm hopelessly optimistic, but there is a potential for transformation uh, both in North America and in Europe. I see potential for transformation too, but in line with um, the next video on my YouTube channel will be on Scotch Poles, States and Social Revolutions. And she examines what she considers to be the three major social revolutions of modernity and the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution and the Chinese Revolution, which she says are distinct from other political revolutions because the entire socioeconomic system is reorganized by them, not simply its political class is replaced or something by another faction. And in all three cases, what occurs is that the kind of international system um, and its effects on a particular, all these three states, like the, the French, Russian, and Chinese states, conflicts with the internal class dynamics within these countries. So um, in the case of the French, the British, they started reforming um, socioeconomically and started outcompeting them um, economically and therefore militarily. Um, and the French, uh, you know, the French absolutism in order to survive needed to basically reform its economic system in a way that would piss off the French aristocrats. And this turned the aristocrats uh, against uh, the king and destabilized the whole play, uh, the whole country. And then you get the French Revolution, ultimately. Um, and the same thing basically occurred in the destabilization of Russian and, and, and Chinese absolutism. Um, you know, with the Russians, obviously, they they fight World War One. this destabilizes their entire social structure and with the Chinese, uh, similar, similar situation. So what we're seeing, I think, is this same kind of contradiction emerging in the United States where the internal class dynamics, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's kind of financial imperialism is now running into contradiction with its geopolitical logic. Mm -hmm. And so I think this will present us with an opportunity for a massive, re uh, you know, in the same way as Scotch Ball's theory lays out. So I think that's an important text for us uh, to, you know, focus on as a movement. So I'm not saying that uh, collapse is in, in, in a kind of vulgar sense. Like I think structurally there is contradictions within the system that ultimately have to, like these structural realities have to express themselves. Um, and uh, so I think uh, Insofar as that's the case, I think ultimately there is hope for a future for the West, um, because the, obviously the current ruling class, I think, is degenerate and uninspiring and and, and so forth. Um, and so getting a worthy adversary like we have now got, I think, is maybe the best thing for us spiritually. Yeah, absolutely. What? Wh who is the author of the text you're mentioning? Scotch Paul? Data Scotch Paul. S-K-O-C-P-O-L is how, okay. you pronounce a, how you spell a last name. Um, All right, two, yeah. two more super chats from uh, Yehuda. He says, Keith and Richard, do you agree that Joel bears a striking resemblance to the Chechen militia fighters who've been seen in cities like Mariupol? I do. Well, we um, don't know where Joel is broadcasting from at this moment. I mean, it might very well be uh, Kiev. Well, he, he's, he's two rooms across from me right now. So. Oh, okay. Well, where <laughs> are you? skipped off to Ukraine. Well, that's the question as well. That's right. A need to know basis, that one. <laughs> Uh, you had also said, Joel, doesn't the fact that nations like Finland and Sweden are running into the arms of NATO kind of prove Richard's point that the Westphalian nation state has been superseded by empires? Well, not, not really, because, I mean, the, the kind of security structure of the international system um, is what it is. If you are a small state um, and you, you know, as Mearsheimer says, you're in the backyard of a great power, um, you're going to need some help to defend yourself or you're going to have to get along with that great power. It's, it's one or the other. Um, clearly, the Ukrainians didn't listen to this logic and now their country's been wrecked, unfortunately. Um, and that whole situation was mishandled. So I, I think that's really all it is. I mean, it's it, Finland is already economically integrated into the West. It's part of the EU. Um, so it would just be a kind of formalization of that uh, to create an extra prohibition against a Russian invasion. But I doubt the Russians will probably will try to invade Finland anyway. It didn't work out too well for them last time. So. All right. Um, Red Line said, important debate. Thank you for hosting, Keith. Uh, Sir Leon said, what about Francis Parker Yockey's interpretation of an empire in Imperium? And he said, that's for Richard Spencer. Um, I haven't read Yaki in a little while. Uh, I, I some of the points that I remember from that, um, I, I think he was he was kind of saying uh, he was making a critique about America that it 
it isn't an empire in an older sense. It, it's kind of almost like it's almost like a hoppy end point or something. It, it was like special interest, get a hold of this mechanism and kind of use it in their own way. So there's no kind of long term continuum. I, I think that's a good critique. I, I do think there there is a, a kind of deep state and, and long term continuum to the American empire to a degree. But I, I, I think uh, it's also true that you have special interest force that almost take a joy ride in the American empire and, and take us in, in terrible directions. Um, I don't well, know that, if there's that something kind of else. Ties into, that kind of ties into the next question. Actually, um, James Watson said, what changes will the U S be able to make in order to lead in this bifurcated world? Well, you know, it's, it, it's funny because I, I, I think the Trump, if you look back at like Trump in 2016, um, and some of the slogans that were present there, let's get out of NATO, you know, what, what is it for kind of thing? Let's re it was effectively, let's reindustrialize. Um, we're going to bring back coal mining of all things. And, uh, and, and, you know, he was at least gesturing towards, Bring back, uh, bringing back manufacturing. Let's have national health care was also kind of a almost assumption. I'll, he said, I'll take care of people. Um, I, I think Trump came in a very important moment and those slogans really resonated with people. It kind of came at a moment when a lot of the population was seeing the American empire as a kind of detriment and not as a benefit to them. Um, there was the long hangover of the Iraq war, which obviously was a, a terrible decision. Uh, there was a globalization, depletion of the middle class, all of these things that we, we know. And there was an almost a sense of like, let's try it a different way. But that, you know, being America first in that sense would also entail kind of giving up a lot of these imperial burdens that Americans have to some degree, at least, and I think to a large degree benefited from. So it was it was a kind of curious moment. Now, as it turns out, Trump did none of these things. Trade deficits increased under Trump. Um, a, a lot of the bringing back manufacturing is, is extremely uh, overdone. Uh, uh, and and a kind of interesting thing is as I as Joel mentioned, you know, an hour ago, is that Biden seemed to kind of steal a lot of that thunder. Um, if America is going to survive and thrive in this new world that has been this new paradigm that's been announced in the past week, it is going to have to change in some way. And I do think that there are enough, I mean, say what you will about Joe Biden. I, I do think that there are enough forces that recognize that to a, a, some degree. You cannot just absolutely demean and admonish and and condemn all of the people who are going to need to fight in your armed forces against a resurgent Russia or aggressive Russia and maybe a, a, a rising China. You cannot engage in endless critical race theory discussions with white people who are going to fight these battles. Uh, you are going to need to have energy independence, including, I would say, nuclear power is a must. I mean, there are at least voices. There's some kind of potential. I'm not saying we're going to win or we're going to do these things, but there is at least some kind of like rational forces in this country that will be pushing in that direction. So, I mean, I've been more optimistic uh, as of this past week that there can be some positive change in America than I ever have been. Now, whether I'm right, we'll see. All right, Joshua Larson said, uh, question for Richard, when the rubber hits the road, will the rubber in fact hit the road? <laughs> uh, Nance Ball NRX said, well, in, Western in physics, communists... you know, they, things never actually touch. There's just kind of electromagnetic thing. So the rubber truly never hits the road. Uh, Nance Ball NRX said, You're Western welcome. communist dissidents totally marginalized themselves during the Cold War, despite bilateral strategic relationships with foreign imperium. <laughs> Why should Western nationalist dissidents pursue the same failed strategy? I guess that's for you, Joel. What, do you, what are they saying? Like we should start taking money from the Chinese or something to promote nationalism? I think I think it's the other way around. I think he's saying oh, that. Uh, well, I, I would never want to take any support the from the enemies of my nation if I'm pursuing nationalism. That doesn't make any sense. Also, it's a good way for the feds to get up your ass and shut you down. So 
I 100% agree. I, I won't name names here, but the um, I am. I think it's amazing the this pro Putin, pro Russia stuff when th- there is a. I mean, I mean you, you, yes, the Feds but are going to take have notice. We have a super of that. chat on this actually. It said uh, the, the Feds uh, are going to take new, from... note of that. But ethically speaking, um, people who do that are fucking traitors. Well, I think it's important uh, to have discourse about why Putin did what he did and how the American management of the situation created the scenario. I think um, if that gets misconstrued as, well, you're just being pro-Putin because you're making excuses for the invasion. Like I said before, you need to, if you're going to have enemies and you want to win, you need to actually competently understand their thinking. This narrative that the Western media is pushing that Putin's just crazy and he's just invading countries because he's a big meanie is retarded. If we think like this, we're not going to make smart policy decisions or have, and that's, and that, that seems to be what is being pushed. Um, so in my view, I can completely, if, if, if I was in his shoes, if I was the president of Russia in the Kremlin and I was presented with the exact same strategic scenario, I think I would have felt like I had to make the same decision that he made. I think it's a completely rational decision. Um, and it's a shame that, uh, the Russian, as you were saying before, it's a shame that the Russians weren't brought into NATO in the two thousands. It's a shame that we didn't mm-hmm. pursue friendship with the Russians, um i think that was a massive strategic error um and i think uh basically what i think maybe the upside of this is that what the americans have done by alienating the russians is perhaps give china everything it needs to win the next cold war and then force us to change our political system into being something that is less retarded so interesting the the super check kind of related to this from warren says uh this week again on twitter spaces richard said the distant right spade of unpalatable takes is the product of his thought leaders being on russia's payroll purely as a thought experiment does richard think keith or joel fit the profile of this particular type of shill in any way no i mean (laughs) i think they were wanting to get some (laughs) hot takes there no i mean this discussion is totally rational i i agree with everything that joel said you you have to try to attempt to rationally and and, in 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 some ways charitably understand your opponent you have to try to walk in their shoes see how they see the world and not just engage in shrill nonsense I, i i totally agree um, uh, there, I can find plenty of exam- examples of the dissident of dissident right thought leaders openly supporting the destruction of the U.S. empire and NATO, and openly more than sympathizing with Russia. Those people are fucking traitors. Period. They are not engaging in Mearsheimer like, you know, criticism. Uh, or the criticism that I've I've seen from you two. There's another kind of more subtle form of this. But again, this, Richard, like, I mean the I mean what what's the greater agent of white displacement or or white genocide than than the U.S. empire? I mean, why would you conflate the two of of loyalty to the West meaning loyalty to those are just two the U.S. State separate, Department? Those are those are two just separate questions like demographic displacement and. Um, American foreign policy. I mean, in my own small way, I was a radical anti-war activist, uh, you know, in the in the Bush era. Uh, those are just two very different questions. What I well, would I mean, strongly it, it say is, is that Putin, sa- is, the same Putin is anti-West. Wolf, right? Putin would love for there to be racial displacement across the Western world. Uh, Putin would love for the West to sink even further than we have into decadence. Putin does not have the be- the best interest of the white race uh, at heart at all, and sympathizing with him is wrong. And I did that in times in my career, and I I have changed. And I think there's a very strong point. argument though that the Russians and even Putin himself had a far uh, more f- uh, attemptedly friendly relationship with the uh, with the West in the late '90s, early 2000s. There was, I think, a sense with the Russians that that they could join the West and the yeah. West rejected them. And so them, uh, we made them into an enemy. I feel there was an opportunity to make them into a friend and we chose to make them into an enemy. And so I, I think you can't really blame them for seeing us as an enemy as a result. Of I, I I agree with so much of that, but I, I, I wonder if Putin himself, knowing his background, uh, ever had that vision as well. 
And there, there is an interesting speech that he gave. Um, I believe, I, I think it might have been to like the Adenauer Institute or something. It was in Germany where he spoke in German uh, for a time, where he was kind of making some of these offerings in the late '90s. But whether he has that vision as well, or whether he has a vision of a Russia and a Russian empire that is defining itself as anti-West. I, I think needs to be brought up. I, I don't I don't think this kind of like broader white world that many people uh, support is possible with Vladimir Putin. It might might be possible uh, with another uh, Russian leader that comes after him. P Putin did say in his speech on the night of the invasion that he requested to Bill Clinton that he tried to have a conversation with him about Russia joining NATO and that he was he was very much shut down. But uh that's I mean, important. again, the I still don't really understand this logic. I mean, if if U.S. foreign policy is run in the interests of the financial oligarchs and it's run through the, the Council on Foreign Relations and they're doing things that I mean, you've kind of acknowledged the logic of the Russian invasion and that you know it can't have a a NATO member on its border, it can't allow you know U.S. subversion to happen that close to it. Um, so I mean, if you're acknowledging the kind of logic uh, of what motivated Russia and their kind of ethical case in that regard, but then you still want us to side with Western foreign policy that's being dictated by financial oligarchs. I mean, it's yeah, like, well, think, there's no, it's, it's really in our it's interest. The it's the tragedy of great power politics. It's, it's not the, 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 the comedy or whatever. I mean, we have interest. We live in the West. We have interest. I can understand his interest. Now, just a, a mild correction. I mean, Putin has now um, uh, dictated that there will be NATO on his borders uh, by, <laughs> if he does successfully take over Ukraine. But um, I, I think there is some like deeper historical uh, components to his, you know, lust after that uh, territory. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we have interest in the West. This is where we are situated. This is who we are. We 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 simply like if there's going to be a very important paradigmatic conflict for the next 30 to 50 years, which I think there will be. Um, this is where we live. And this is, uh, you, you cannot avoid it. And simply siding I mean, with the other I side. I think we need to, we need to, to, we need to criticize the to prison decisions. or marginalization. We need to criticize the policy decisions that led to this though, because there was a lot of people of in the West that were saying, and we have former Australian prime ministers, foreign policy experts, people that worked on the Clinton administration for the State Department, all kinds of people who know what they're talking about, military generals who said that we shouldn't be pursuing the uh, security integration of Ukraine. The Russians see that as an existential threat, and we're going to back them into a corner and it's going to wreck Ukraine. And the fact that no one listened to that uh, and that it was pursued anyway, in my view, I think it was cynically pursued by the Americans because they wanted the Russians to go in because it gave them the pretext for sectioning Europe off from Russia. Obviously, the Europeans were buying all the Russian gas and, and, and so forth. And there was a fear of Russian European integration in Washington. And I think that was a bad thing. So I think I think overall, the real um responsibility the real bad leadership here has been with uh, washington and moscow is a reactive force look moscow has agency and and th this is this this notion that they that that moscow didn't make some kind of strategic decision to do this and that it doesn't have interests that are antithetical to the west is just wrong it does have agency i would also just mention this I mean, if you're on a football team and the coach calls a play, like let's say he says, let's run, sorry for the football, American football metaphors, please, uh, I'll apologize. But um, he says, we're going to run the ball on third down. You, oh, what a stupid decision. You know, We should pass on third down, of course. It, you can talk about that decision that he made, that sovereign decision that he made later. But the play is on right now. The ball's being hiked and you better go block your man and run the ball as dictated by the play. You can't just 
endlessly engage in this. I don't kind think of, like, I don't think anyone has run the ball on third down and an entire country got wrecked though. So it's kind of different, isn't it? And also, more importantly, what is the yeah. West actually supposed to be doing here? Do do we want um, a long war in Ukraine because we think it's bad for Russia, or or, or would you, or do you actually care about the Ukrainian people? Because if you do, you would want it to be over quickly and them to return to some kind of neutral status, so that. The country can return back. Theoretically, to I would want it to be over. Theoretically, you can say, oh, it should be over quickly so that they can just be neutralized and fewer people will die. The fact is, Ukrainians, they're not listening to that. Ukrainians are fighting. Do you, do you think yeah, they're but, all, this is all yeah, like a, the, a West should the we US, arm, the US the US Department is a huge Should we be arming right? them? Should we be giving them support and weapons and so forth, encouraging them to continue the war? Or should we encourage them to make it a deal and try and, and try? You and can end? encourage them, but they're going to fight regardless. And the fact is like, this is where we are. This is where we are situated. It very, if I were the state department, uh, if I were the Secretary of State by by some miracle, I probably would have handled this in a different way and made some kind of deal with Putin and said, well, let's say that Ukraine gets to be in the EU. However, we will sign a sovereign declaration that for the next 50 years, they will never join NATO. They will be effectively neutralized. I would be more than willing to offer some kind of deal like that. Now, whether Putin would accept that or whether Putin always wanted the whole thing is also questionable. I, I think he does, actually. Uh, but again, all of this stuff, you can write about this critically, but it, it is kind of all hindsight and hair splitting. This is where we are. We are in a Cold War situation right now, and you cannot take the other side. You will either end up in prison or you will end up in total marginalization by chanting Russia, 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 or just engaging in this just just kind of nonsensical analysis you see from these like so-called anti-interventionist and right-wing leftist who are just basically just giving you this misrepresentation of, of things which make Wait, it all about think, like you, ukrainian you should, nazis or something so you think you think that nato should put a no-fly zone over ukraine no absolutely not okay well isn't that what the anti-interventionists are arguing that that would that it's world war three isn't worth the risk yeah but the anti-interventionists are these paleocons or whatever they're 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 arguing against a ghost biden and blinken his secretary of state have explicitly emphatically and repeatedly said that there will be no uh, there will be no flies yeah, no god. no fly yeah, thank god that there's some sane people left but there's a lot of uh, i agree but who are you arguing against so these paleos are like rehashing 2003 because that's something that's somewhere where these small-minded people can kind of feel comfortable so it's like oh we're anti-interventionist biden has said we're not invading <laughs> Biden has said there's no no fly zone. Whom are you arguing against? And all it is is some just excuse to kind of take Russia's side and be like, oh, isn't it a tragedy that Ukrainians are, are you know are still fighting? I mean, it's it's a weird position to take. I acknowledge that nationalism is a force of human nature. And so of course they're fighting. And a, a Ukrainian nationalism, whether it existed before 2014 or not, we can talk about that. It, it hell, hell yes, it exists now. I mean, Obviously, one way to create a nation is to invade it. With the Ukrainian you seem to be just and, assuming, uh, if I can get in, you seem to be just assuming that there's an identity between um, the goals of U U.S. foreign policy and what's good for Europeans. I mean, in the case of Ukraine, it's good for U.S. foreign policy to turn Ukraine into another Afghanistan. And just use it to bleed, you know, Russian blood and treasure and um, flood it with arms. That's not good for the Ukrainian people. It's not good for the Russian people. And I don't think it's good for Western Europeans. You know, something like the Nord Stream 2 cancellation. The interests of Europeans would be to have closer economic ties with Russia, to have a, a realist foreign policy, to have Ukraine as a neutral state. What we're seeing now is what's in the interests of, you know, the Jews that run the, the State Department, Anthony Blinken and Victoria Nuland, who's, who's married to Robert Kagan. He's like hawkish anti-russian uh people that are in control of, of u.s foreign policy so that, i mean we have to go along with that because they happen to be governing us criticize um, it all you criticize it all you want i obviously would prefer a very different situation i don't think that putin if i had if i were miraculously secretary of state and i offered some kind of neutralization guarantee of ukraine 
and but kind of didn't just give it over, you know, kind of kept it in the EU or something. I doubt Putin would have accepted that. I think Putin has maximalist aims, in fact. And I also, yeah, another world is possible. Look at the European people. What what are they excited about? What are they behind? They are falling over themselves to join NATO. Now you can say this is this is you can criticize that it's bad. There are serious problems with that. Whatever that that's what is happening. Yeah, and like is, this, this is this where we are. This he, is where we're situated. Putin would have taken the deal. That deal was never offered. Um, okay. So how do you like? It, it, I don't know. Russians have paid a massive price to do this. So obviously it was a last resort thing. I mean, it's been eight years since the uh, the, the coup, the revolution. Um, why why did they wait eight years? It seems. I don't like... think it's a last resort. I I think this is a a bit. I think Putin is trying to be the next Peter. I mean, I, I think he wants to be a great man of Russian history. He is He's attempting. Die. It's clearly it's the risk. The, the risks are high doing something like this. So the idea that there was no prohibitions that like it, it wasn't a rationally motivated decision, but he just wants to be like this great man of history, conquering territories. I don't. I don't buy it. I think. Uh, I think it's a rational decision made for rational reasons. I, I well, I think it's rational in in, in that sense. But I, I think what you're falling into the trap of realist commentary, where it, it's like people are almost like trapped by the, the the these like you know confines of like certain economic factors and so on. I mean, you you need to factor in veer two in all this. I, I again, I agree. If I were Secretary of State and we didn't have the people running our country that we do, things would be different and hopefully a lot better. But you also can't deny the agency and the the veer two of someone like Putin who imagines himself as bringing back all of the Russian lands and reestablishing Russia as a great empire. I mean, that's a real thing. He did this. It's not like we... Now, this is what I get listening to like this, you know, Jimmy Dore, like the the gray zone, all this like, you know, ant, so-called anti-woke left commentary. It, it, it's like no one has agency outside of Ukrainian neo-Nazis and like Washington. So it's only this like evil thing. And Putin is just what what could he do? It's it, oh, he Putin's the real victim here. Washington forces. I mean, give me a break. Well, he's not a victim. He's he's uh, responding to the point is that the Russians Again, need to he do has a agency. If, if you're trying to if you're trying to work out a, a security structure for the world and, and ultimately the aim for that should be basically peace, uh, ultimately. Right. Because you don't want wars happening and people dying it's it's very bad right so you have to respect the most powerful countries in the world if moscow has seven thousand nuclear weapons and it has it can mobilize hundreds of thousands of troops on the ukrainian border and it sees ukraine being part of nato in the west as an existential threat to its security you have to respect it because they have like in the interest of peace they have the ability to back up that fear with an action well, and Joe so, Biden is respecting it. Well, no, but what do you mean? Like overthrowing the Ukrainian government eight years ago, like we have like a phone call of Victoria Nuland literally like picking on the phone, the new Ukrainian government, convincing the uh, the Ukrainians to take an anti-Russian stance. And you can't tell me that Washington didn't. A, didn't a lot of those revolutions were very organic. I mean, uh, the CIA will jump in when it sees something. But the notion that like, the 2004 Orange Revolution or Maidan was just like purely a CIA op, and Ukraine just I'm talking, really I'm truly about, wants to I'm be with about Russia. The security That's calculation. Just I'm talking about people who who run the world, who have to negotiate world security. They have to take that into consideration. If the the people in Ukraine are discontented, that's fine, um, but. In basically trying to use that discontent to pursue, you know, don't you think? Don't you think on, on some level? Don't you happening? think on some level Putin would see Ukraine? U Ukrainian large majorities wanted to enter by 2014. Large majorities, significant majorities, wanted to enter NATO. But put that aside because NATO is a military alliance. Majorities wanted to enter the EU. Don't you think that Putin, or do you think? That Putin would have seen Ukraine's entrance into EU as equally a kind of existential threat. 
you're, you're taking away what, what he understands as Russia. I mean, don't, don't, well, the Russians, maybe you don't offered, think that the Russians offered a deal because the Ukrainians obviously <laughs> had a deal offered by the EU for an economic partnership and a deal offered by the Russians. The Russians offered after shit started to hit the fan with Euromaiden, they offered to say, look, we can have a deal where you can have a deal with the EU and with us. You don't have, you can have a deal right. with both of us. And the EU rejected it under, in my opinion, it would have been under the pressure of Washington. Washington, this entire time, was 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 basically pursuing this anti-Russian agenda. And even if the people in Ukraine have an anti-Russian attitude, it's still, from a rational perspective, it was in their interests to have neutrality um, because the Russians are fucking powerful and they're on your border and they can invade I, your I, country. I get it, but why are they fighting then if that's so rational? I mean, like... I, I, I under, you know, like you make excellent points. I absolutely agree. This could have been handled better. And if I were in the state department or better people were in the state department, we would not have this just vehemently anti-Russian attitude, but you seem to be making decisions for the Ukrainian people. The Ukrainian people want to take up arms and resist. They're willing to die for this. We're seeing it before our eyes. Yeah, I'm, I empathize with those people, but my point is, is my point was that it, they they were let down by their leadership. I don't blame the Ukrainian people. I think if they had okay. leadership that had their best interests at heart, they would have acted differently. Okay. I mean, isn't there an irony that you're you're kind of falling back on a a moral argument for nationalism here, <laughs> Richard, when you talk about the <laughs> Ukrainians' desire for self determination away from the Russians? Yeah, yeah. Well, national. Na I mean, as I said, nationalism is a a, a part of human nature. Yeah. Uh, well, we have a we actually have a question from Tyler Hamilton. Um, yeah, this is kind of an interesting question. I think it kind of gets to the root of of the disagreement because um, I think this the debate ended up being more kind of uh, structural rather than focused on like the the moral aspect. Uh, but he says one of the main problems with modernity seems to be the increasing tendency towards homogenization and mass culture, organized around centralized political institutions. Do you have concerns that empire can be destructive to the sense of rootedness and locality that provide human beings with a sense of home and therefore that nations or other subsidiary political forms can check against this? Yes. Is this to me, I guess? I guess yeah. that's to you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think this is that kind of... Um... Uh, end of history and, and remember the sub or the subtitle or part of the title of the end of history was the last man so i mean fukuyama even in his you know glorious pain to americanization was even talking about n directly referencing nietzsche's last man that is the the ultimate bourgeois citizen who doesn't even think about god or life or death or or virtue or anything like that but but simply wants to consume and fill his belly um i absolutely think that that is that kind that form of nihilism is a, a very serious issue and that a kind of planetary empire or like american empire brought to its full culmination would create something like that or it seeks to create it i think there's that nihilistic tendency within the west that we need to confront and address um but is, isn't the localized ethnos in the form of the nation said much more a sense of rootedness and something that can combat against alienation rather than this European civilizational identity, which, you know, I would say is, is, is quite abstract. And, and I, I, I'd even question, you know, how you define that. Um, Cause you know, even against, even against has, it seemed uh, quite vague. Whereas, you know, the ethnos is, is something that people live out every day. Right. I mean, I, what I, what I was saying about nationalism, it's it's sometimes both too big and and too small. It doesn't even capture that that great German term Heimat, that that homeness, which isn't just like I'm an American, but it's like I'm from Nebraska, uh, or I'm from Brooklyn, or something. There there is a kind of local rootedness that is a part of human nature. Um, that needs to be integrated into anything. I, I think whenever any kind of entity starts to uh, attack that or attempt to break away from that it, it, it's kind of bound for failure uh i i think that's a real thing but again i don't see the world i, I think that like the fukuyama 
you know, outcome that a lot of right wingers fear is I don't see the world headed in that direction right now. I, I see us as kind of headed back into the 20th century in many ways. Well, I mean, if there's, this is a pretty big question, but if, there, if there's going to be like a, a Western bloc, I mean, what, what is this European identity? What is the, the foundation for the European identity in, in your view? Because there's, there's a lot of disagreement within that as well. Well, the, the, current, European, the current European project is, is just liberalism, basically. Yeah, I mean, the European Union has kind of offered some statements uh, were based on a, a kind of classical background. Um, there was, uh, if you look at European money, there's a lot of bridges, <laughs> uh, columns and things like that. It, it, it is a, a, extremely vague. Uh, there was a kind of notion of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the Ode to Joy is an almost national anthem. I mean, I, I think we're kind of in the birth pangs of an attempt to do this. I do think that any empire has been on some level an attempt to replicate Rome, whether that's the Catholic Church, the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium, uh, the British Empire. It, it, in its own ways, um, there have been even even American empire in the in the continental sense. Um, had a, a deeply kind of Roman quality. You can see this in, in choice of architecture and language. Um, actually, George Washington would use that term for the nation. Um, so it, it, the, Rome as a political entity is always at the, the center of that as a political project. Now, in terms of evoking a kind of European culture and so on, um, I do think there's a lot of coming together, communication, intermarriage and so on but yeah kind of can can shakespeare be italian and can dante be english and can beethoven be french i mean i i, I think that's uh it's a really interesting question but i i do think that there's a cultural heritage that we have and there's a kind of cultural nihilistic heritage that we we have that we inherited from um plato and christianity do you want to get in there joel or will i move to the next question yeah, well, I guess it, it's one of those things that remains to be seen. I mean, um, like if you look at the history of French nationalism, uh, German nationalism, Italian nationalism, obviously these were nations forged out of regional identities. Uh, and I think particularly in the French and the German examples, it was successful. So it's not like there's no precedent for this. Um, but the difficulty of, of of doing it, I think, is is higher in in, in the European um, experience because there's just more difference um, than there was between the different regions of Germany or France. So it'd have to be a long term project, and it would probably still entail a, a lot of um, autonomy. Um, but you know, with between the individual member states. Um, but what? what but almost difficult... almost every people point to of the formation of a nation where there's an ethnogenesis where other ethnic groups disappear these are almost from before these are almost always from before the time of the age of nationalism this hasn't really happened in modern times in the same way because it gets back to that thing again once an ethnic group has a national self-conception you can't really put that genie back in the bottle yeah and i think you would endure you couldn't. I don't think you could, it would be like an abolition of Frenchness or Germanness. It would have. You would have to have both it would have to it would have to be both not just one or the other um and it gradually to become more important over time but i think it's a very i don't see exactly why it is even super necessary why can't europe just be like it is a shared economic area and have a military alliance and um have been like you know nations which are friends uh why do they need to give up their particular national identities it seems like the bigger problem that they need to deal with is like you know, <laughs> the mass immigration of non-Europeans uh, into Europe, diluting uh, Europeanness as opposed to, you know, French people not feeling French anymore, Germans not feeling German anymore. But in many ways, the refugee I think... crisis has in a way inspired a kind of racial consciousness. I mean, but maybe like if you look at like the, the more speeches in, in France, for example, he says like to be French is this very complicated history you know, with many different components. Um, and that seems to be, you know, what people that are against immigration are identifying with, where people that are fine with immigration into Europe, uh, people who vote for someone like Macron, who is pursuing this European unity. So it seems as though European unity seems to be <laughs> associated with a whole bunch of things that actually would undermine Europe being a coherent thing in the first place. And the people that actually 
do care about the things that make Europe Europe uh, happen to be more nationalistic. Uh, but and, but and... it's going to kind of happen that way, you know. And uh, you know, I mean, it's a kind of Nixon goes to China moment. Um, I think you're overstating M Macron's like immigration enthusiasm, uh, but never I, I i certainly understand where you're coming from but yeah there there are going to be these kind of caducian forces that i i hope at least will kind of work themselves out into a a broader european consciousness and in general like the european the the right wing like brexit type parties and things like that i, I mean those have are, are disappearing the french um uh, the Front National, not Zemmour, I guess, but the Front National is, is um, I, I, at least they quiet down about leaving the EU, at least to my understanding. Um, so I think we're already kind of past this question. And exiting the EU is now not even a, that, that's like well back in the rearview mirror at this point. I, uh, with, the, with the Cold War on and Russia as a major force and enthusiasm for NATO, I mean, I... I Absolutely, well, I don't think any kind of exit from the EU is in the cards. It it has a particular economic logic. Like, let's say, for argument's sake, um, I'm right, and the West lose Cold War II, and there's some kind of massive economic crisis, collapse uh, of the financial system, or something like this. I could definitely see um, the European Union fracturing at that point because the you know, the nations that are economically better off are going to be like, well, we don't want to be responsible for taking care of all these poor nations. And so you could see it, it, it re-divide under, under stress, which is obviously what happened to the Soviet Union, right? Vulcanization. Right. Um, and so there's a lot of precedent for, for this to happen. Um, in order for it to work, it would need to work. You know, it would need to keep having an underlying, um, like it would have to be, basically providing good to the people of Europe. Uh, so they would have to be demonstrating its value over time. And under its current organization, I'm very skeptical. I mean, if it, if it, if it keeps importing non-Europeans in and it keeps promoting these, uh, the current set of values that are dominant in Europe, I've, I, I don't, I don't see that as uh, and, and, you know, it loses the cold war and it does, and, and it destroys its own economy through putting sanctions on Russia and all this kind of stuff. Um, I think it might struggle. So it would, it, it's really an open question though. And it's, it's one that, um, you know, like it has to be worked out in history. Uh, you would need, but I think ultimately the, the real question, both in the United States and in Europe is actually forming a competent managerial elite who actually act in the interest of Europe or the United States until you have that, um, the structural integrity of, of the United States and Europe, I think is, is, it's fully undermined. I mean, it's, it's, it's not even, it, like we're talking about Europe being integrated, we don't even know for certain if the United States will still exist 200 years from now in its current uh, in, in its current form necessarily, because you know under stress, um, you know re regional identities become you know important again. So, fair enough. All right, I can go to the next super chat. Um, Jess said the Bosch to State Department propaganda pipeline and the Richard Spencer to Jen Psaki pipeline proved that on the level of regime plans, horseshoe theory is true. <laughs> uh, Blunder Buzz said uh, if the Austrian painter rose from the grave and led a panzer attack on Moscow, would he be praised or scowled at by our leader leaders? Uh, Warren said this week on Twitter spaces, Richard said Putin is similar to Dugan and that he wants chaos and the very worst for Western nations. How does Richard reconcile this with dissident right thought leaders, Eurasian saviorism and the zeal with which they prostrate themselves at Putin's feet? Um, well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think I really need to reconcile that. I, I think that there is a a tendency to hate our current elite so much that you desire the absolute destruction of your own land. And I, and I think there's even a kind of savior complex in another sense of like, I hear that, you know, oh, the West just has to die and then it will all be reborn or something, this, this you know, resurrection uh, kind of concept where, you know, these woke people are just so bad. We just need to throw everything out and it will just from the rubble, something new will be born. I, I think that's a, a, a really wrong 
that's just the wrong way to look at these things. I mean, I, I think the better way is about transformation and trans evaluation. It's, it's like, how can someone like Jen Psaki in a way be transformed by these circumstances? If someone had told me 10 years ago that Germany would double its military budget and rearm to the great applause of its European neighbors, I would have said, oh, that's impossible. That can't happen. They, they would call them Nazis. They wouldn't do it anyway, blah, blah, blah. Well, it has happened. It, like, sit, the reality can change and force a change of consciousness. And um, that is a just infinitely more productive way of looking at America and the Western world. I know it's bad, but that's an infinitely more productive way of looking at our homeland than just to be this kind of black pill, like just let it all fall or or whatever. I, I just think that's well, just one thing. Is, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of retards though that have this uh, on the pro-Ukrainian side with the you know the little Ukrainian flag avatar people. Mm -hmm. um and and they'll say thing i'll i'll make the arguments i've made and they'll say why like you know you just love putin and you think putin's going to save the like it's, a, it's it's a total mischaracterization like i haven't seen that many people actually arguing like that maybe ironically but unironically i don't think it's as prevalent i think it's kind of a a production of of the kind of imaginary of of, of like the opponents of of this position more so than it being an actual real phenomenon um and uh, you know, it's in the same sense that like uh, people were happy, myself included, to see the Taliban win in, in, in Afghanistan because it was like we actually deserve to take that L as a civilization because um, we were operating on a ridiculous logic of nation building. That's just bad. It's subjectively bad. And so it needs to lose so that we can learn to stop doing that. Um, and 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 so it was like a victory for the truth. Uh, and, and just like if um, I get it, Joel, but cases, like the difference is you going over to Afghanistan and fighting on behalf of the <laughs> Taliban, or which you did not do, at least to my knowledge. Um, and uh, or just this like Putin will save us. The dynamic that we have seen in play throughout the Trump era, and definitely the dynamic now, is that Putin wants to harm you. Putin does not want a revitalized the, West. Well, Putin wants thing chaos is, in the West. I mean, I haven't really seen... I mean, I think this is a generally a straw man. I mean, I always get accused of this as well, that I, I think Putin is going to save the white race or something because of criticized uh, US foreign policy in Ukraine. I mean, I think that's a straw man. I don't see people saying that. But the other thing yeah, is... Keith, Nick Fuentes chants Putin at a rally. I mean, that this is what we're... Okay. Yeah, is but, but the thing is, the example? thing is, this is... But this is presented <laughs> yeah. as... This is presented as a kind of an ex... But I think the problem is this is presented as like an existential struggle for Europe in that like, oh, well, if if we lose to Russia, as if like Russia is going to occupy Western Europe or same thing with China, you know, you want right, that's China right. to give the State Department a bloody nose, you know, well, if you lived under the Chinese, things would be just as bad. But I mean, there isn't this uh, existential threat to Europe there of of being occupied by Russia. So at the end of the day, it's it's not really, uh, I don't see how, how it's treacherous to your people, you know, to want yeah, to... Yeah, it's, it's not, the, the Cold War would never be able to reach Europe. Nukes exist. Yeah. yeah, and the threat to that is is supporting the uh, U.S. State Department and U.S. foreign policy that is that has been um, pushed for conflict conflict with Russia for for decades. And I think we've pretty much yeah, agreed but... the three of us that that the U.S. is one that has really been stoking most of this. They're not insane. I mean, B Biden did not go up to the State of the Union and say, you know, it's all or nothing. You know, ride or die with Ukraine. He he said we will not send in troops. I mean, it, look, these people are not insane. I mean, they 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 stoke Russia. There there is truly, genuinely anti-Russian forces within the Washington establishment. Agreed, but they, they there is like a censor or like check on total insanity in Washington. I mean, yeah, well, but I mean, if there's saying blood in Ukraine with, with, with javelin missiles and. But you, but you were saying Sorry, before that, that Putin wants like the the West to like he's he's against us. He doesn't want the yeah. West to be revitalized. He defines but, Russianism but, as anti-Western. Yes, but the as point is, Dugan. but the, the point is, is that well, we have a bunch of nukes pointed at Moscow. He has a bunch of nukes pointed back in the other direction. So he can who gives a shit what he thinks about us? Ultimately, it's our own internal politics that really matters. And this idea that like we're never going to actually go to war with the with these people. We're competing. The Cold War, the competition of the Cold War is not a direct confrontation of one group against the other. It's 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 like who can have the better system. 
And so our competition is with our own elites to reform our system into being actually competitive. It's not with Putin. We're kind of like trying to, we're trying to do statecraft better than Putin and G. We're not like actually fighting them on, on a, like a real battlefield. Agreed. Maybe like but, proxy wars and stuff, but you know what I mean? Uh, agreed. But maybe it, the the possibility of that type of transformation i would hopefully suggest wishfully suggest perhaps is more possible now with putin being this aggressive that that kind of existential dread of nuclear annihilation is going to bring about a better form of america and a better form of europe than the when that is absent and we have no enemies abroad and we just turn on ourselves that's what I'm suggesting. I hope we at least get some better music out of it. Well, the 80s was great. I was pumping craft work the other day because I was like, Oh, I know. Let's go, Cold War. Exactly. Like out of on. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, someone with no username said, Great discussion. Thanks, Joel, Richard, and Keith. Thank you. Uh, Europa Aesthetica uh, said, Thank you for the debate. I'm a fan of all three of you. Do you think Western severance with Russia will create a kind of autarky and a renaissance in Russia with Chinese trade supporting this, or will they become purely the bitch of China? I think they'll, they'll be seen. I think uh, they'll do well. I think. Um... They have a very compatible economic relationship with the Chinese because the Russians have so much natural resources that the Chinese want to use in order to fuel their production. It's kind of like a match made in heaven in many ways, like the two economies. So I think um, ultimately it, the Russians will, I mean, I think they're going to go through some short term pain, obviously. Um, but once they kind of adjust their economy to being kind of Eurasia centric, even more so than it already is, I think um like I, I see a lot of potential for that development. They do have problems though, like the demographics, like age demographics is a problem. Obviously the Islamification of the country is a massive social problem. Like I think massive amounts of them are addicted to opiates and heroin. I mean, obviously that's true in the West, but it's like even worse in Russia. So it's not like uh, they're going to like ascend to becoming like some hegemonic, uh, you know, super state imperium like overnight. But I think uh, their trajectory looks good with the Chinese, like just from an economic standpoint. Um, I, unlike Putin and Dugan, I wish the best for Russians, uh, Russians. And um, I do see them as part of greater Europe, although not now. Um, but I, I, all of this remains to be seen. And there might be a lot of nostalgia for the American era in which they do become China's bitch. I mean, I, I this is something, I mean, I you can learn things from China's system, but I think you should trust your gut on this and the morality or complete absence thereof of Chinese people when it comes to governing themselves and, and ruling others. All right, two kind of related questions for Richard. Uh, Europa Aesthetica said, is a neo-Rome of all European peoples the ideal? And Eric Orwell said, um, Richard seems to be saying that geopolitics will revolve around imperial or pseudo-imperial actors, but what does he have to offer in terms of legitimating said actors, i.e. why is imperialism better? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I feel like that's maybe one area we didn't get into enough in the debate was it, it was much more focused on kind of the direction of things structurally and economically and geopolitically. But I mean, it, it is ultimately a moral question for everyone here. Um, well, like I was saying, when I brought up that my na definition of nationalism at the beginning is the identity of the governed with each other and with their government. And obviously that legitimates the state. This doesn't mean that I'm uh, like, there's different ways you can interpret democracy. So, I mean, I'm I'm a managerialist, so I don't think that it's just like you just have this random collection of people, or they just like spontaneously develop an entire governing ideology out of like you know the free market of ideas or something. This is a liberal idea. I'd be in a liberal nationalist, so I would say, well, you actually need to have a cultural and political elite, um, and like intellectual elite that that kind of work out what's in your national interest and work out what your national history is and formalize it into a set of disciplines and create a kind of competent ruling class out of this. And, that, and then that kind of has the effect of kind of re-socializing your own people back into itself. Uh, and, and that over time only should, in theory, if it works well, strengthen the legitimacy of the state because you have this feedback loop between, um, you know, the state's identity and its kind of embrace of its people.
And that would surely be, in my opinion, the ideal that we, we would want to strive towards. Right. I, I mean, I think I have answered this to, to some degree. I mean, I, th this is the question of legitimacy and, and not just power politics. You know, I, in my opening statement, I was talking about power of, you know, if you're a nation state, you're just a pawn in someone else's empire and so on. And, and I would stand behind those comments. Uh, but yeah, there, there is a much deeper question of legitimacy and legitimacy does not come from the barrel of the gun, although the barrel of the gun is kind of there, uh, but it, it can't function. You can't just, and, and I do think China will, which is, absent of soft power will discover real problems in this regard you at some point you cannot just simply force people to engage in your will and that's where i think uh stuff that we're doing is, is very important in the sense of legitimizing a sense of romanness that is pan-europeanness togetherness among all people uh legitimizing that in the hearts of mind i mean Karl schmitz you know uh political theories are kind of secularized forms of theology. There, there has to be a spiritual component to legitimacy of a European superstate. And I think that's what we should be engaged in. But I mean, clearly it's not just, um, I mean, your, your criticism isn't just that, you know, nationalism will always be the, the pawn of something bigger. I mean, clearly you think that um, even if it were possible to have whatever Europe of a thousand flags, whatever term for yeah, happy yeah. homelands, that that's not desirable. Well, I mean, I guess we're on Odyssey. It is kind of gay in a way. I mean, it <laughs> it goes I mean, in the '90s sense of that term. Um, it it goes against just yeah our 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 martial spirit, which I think every red blooded person has. I mean, look, say what you will about Zelensky. He's an oligarch himself. He's the tool of an oligarch. He's a Jewish comedian. He's also gay. Oh, I didn't even know that, actually. Okay. Um, uh, well, say what you will about him. I don't know if he's actually gay, like like he has sex with men. I just think he's gay. Gay like, in the 90s sense? Yeah. In the, okay. In the same way that you, you're saying this like pan-nationalism is gay, okay. I think Zelensky is far more gay than that even. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Right. That's your perspective. Have you seen that? But, have you seen that? Um, that uh, I've what is seen it? the it's videos like, where he's in leather or whatever. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty fucking cringe, videos. man. Yeah. That's your I hero. get it. I it's not my hero. I get it. <laughs> I get. No, you love him, man. You you love his gay shtick. I, I get, get it. it. <laughs> but he he has been a hero to the redditor class or online or what have you. Is this? I mean, you can dismiss them, but aren't they reacting to something, which is a brilliant propaganda move, which is that he's staying there and he's going to pick up a gun and fight like this, like however terrible he is, I'll grant a lot of it, most of it, maybe all of it. Um, the fact that he is willing to fight and die, that he's willing to stake, put himself on the stake for his country is deeply inspiring. And that does seem to imply that not all is lost. And yeah, we do like, I, I'm, I don't think empires in the future are going to be just like pure conquering, like Achilles, like just kill them all type stuff. But shouldn't there, I mean, Fukuyama himself went into this in a book that I think is actually really underrated, which is the end of history and the last man. It, it, there, there is some human martial quality in every red-blooded soul to be the winner, to be powerful, to be to have your day in the sun. This has to be activated in some way. And just saying that we're all gonna like put down our weapons and be friends and you know never invade or whatever that that is gay in the ninety sense. It just doesn't speak to the human spirit. And that that will for conquest and dominance. Now, maybe we need to send ourselves into space in order to kind of reduce violence among, you know, we don't have a Russia-Ukraine situation. Fair enough. But it's still there. Yeah, but, it, but in the age of nuclear weapons... That will to and, power. But, it, but in the age of nuclear weapons, we can't uh, settle a lot, a lot of these disputes between the most powerful nations in the world on the battlefield. And so the competition, right. as I was saying before, it, it's it's different. So we are, it is still competitive. As I said, we're, we, the Cold War is competitive statecraft. So I still view what we're doing as 
uh, as competitive and act, that kind of like self actualization of you know will to power, if you want to call it that. But at well, the same time, I think time, even those guys in horn drum glasses and slide rules kind of had boners on when they were like working out like the intricacies of like missile defense system. Like that, even if they weren't literally fighting the commies, there there was a it kind of sent death was in the air, and we need that. That that's a that's a very human thing. I think even if it ceased to exist through some kind of horrible McDonald's empire or something, it, we would almost recreate it naturally. It's just in our nature, tragically. All right, I'm going to get to new super chat. I just checked Odyssey's Odyssey for super chats. We actually have 1,700 over 1,700 watching, which is really impressive numbers for us. It's more than I got on YouTube last week, actually. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's in the trending section there. Actually, I saw someone said that it was uh, the stream was posted on Reddit politics, and some people came from there. So maybe that's uh, that's because we have Richard on. Reddit right? globalism. The Reddit <laughs> maximalism <laughs> is, is paying off. <laughs> Reddit maximalism. <laughs> um, so James K said, "Swede here. The thing which disproves Spencer's <laughs> point here and backs up Joel is that Swedes and Finns are gaslit into abandoning neutrality. Quote drones over nuclear nuclear plants." It is not natural ethnogenesis, but is constructed fear uh, to benefit Zog, not us. Dieter, do you want to take that? I think I kind of addressed it in a way. I just had a different emphasis. I mean, even if even if things are consensual, even if there's a lot of consensuality to a European consciousness, it, it exists within a context. You know, freedom has limits and limits has freedom. Uh, Warren said, given that a contingent of distant right thought leaders are effectively endorsing defecting to Russia and China, does Richard think it's more accurate to classify this contingent as nationalists or Eurasian imperialists? Yeah, this they're, guy is they're, very they're just Eurasian. they're just traitors is what they are. That's all they are. They're black pilled traitors and good riddance. Uh, Kloitgen said, friend of the show, Joseph Kloitgen said, uh, hey, Richard, Aristotle says in politics, and he has like page numbers and stuff listed off, that the polis comes to be for the sake of life and mm. exists for the sake of the good life. Supporting the global empire must ensure what, and uh, his super chat actually cut off there. So um, that's a shame. Let me see. Maybe yeah, but this, this is a good point, though, because you were that. saying, uh, Richard, about how the fear of death and survival mm -hmm. is is integral to the formation of identity. And obviously, these things are important. Like, um, if you want, if you are a nationalist, you want to be in a strong nation that no one can fuck with, right? Because you yeah. have people and, and, and strength is the best way to be secure. But this ultimately doesn't get to the question of what the the telos if you will, what the what the purpose of the political as such is which is you know I agree with the aristotelian definition that it's that it's the goods that it provides that being part of a nation being part of a, a you know a a body of citizenship is supposed to be about you know peace order prosperity you know all these goods that it produces um and I, th I think just that's to, ultimately... to cut you off, just to add context, because he, he did send me the rest of the super chat in a message just so he gets his chat read. Uh, it was supporting the global American empire might ensure whites remain supreme, but how does it ensure that whites remain heterosexual? So that was the rest of the super <laughs> chat. You can carry on. <laughs> But yeah, but like a definition of the good life and, uh, like you know, a, a kind of a moral vision for. For what the what what a Western state should be or what the individual state should be is integral. Uh, just simply being kind of reactive against the evil dictators in other countries. This seems to be, in a way, kind of reinforcing um, liberal norms in a sense of like, well, see, the bad countries have dictators and they invade people and they're mean. Right. We are, you know, it's it's a it kind of like a legitimation of this uh, this this ideology, which right. is ironic because if you look at the opinion polls. Uh, you know, in Russia, Putin is polling as twice as popular as Biden is in, in the United States. Um, and I think the Chinese, their opinion that's, polls show that their government is far more popular. Context, though. No, that's but it, but I think it's I think it's interesting that the so-called um, you know democracies of the West. Hey, Zeus, come here. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the so-called democracies of the West, kind of in a sense, aren't. I mean, this gets the, the kind of Carl Schmitt's idea that democracy and liberalism have this fundamental contradiction uh, between them. That, like the the, the so-called illiberal powers of of the East, like, seem to have more 
a kind of more profound identification with their people and their and their and their citizens than we do it when we have in the West. We have minority yeah. rule. We have, uh, and, and so I think um, this is why it's important to look at to give some respect to you know our our adversaries and say, well, we need to learn from them because we, we've become so decrepit with you know fundamentally with liberal ideology, and uh, when we're going, it's going to be our downfall. It's not something that we should be galvanizing together to fight for or against. Um, okay. Against in, in I see what war. you're saying. I don't think you're going to find a great telos in China, though. I mean, I think you very well might learn from their managerial acumen, but I don't think you're going to find a telos or a sense of... Well, it's unique purpose. to their people and their particular historical you know, experience. It's not... We can't just copy-paste maybe some economic policies or something, but... Yeah, I, I I hope not. I mean, I uh, let me. Uh, I look. I, I agree with so much. I agree with the notion that liberalism is a kind of donut morality with Hitler at the center. So it's kind of like we ain't Hitler seems to be like a Kantian like categorical imperative. So anything that seems to be like Hitler, uh, you know, which could be universalized and and be like Hitler is is wrong. And not being like Hitler is good. And there, thus, like changing your child's gender is not what Hitler would do. So therefore, it's moral. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I know this sounds almost ridiculous to put it in these terms, but I think that's like a liberal way of thinking. Um, I agree. We, we have fallen down this rabbit hole. There is a deep nihilism that infects us all. And I think it even affects Russia to a degree. I mean, after all, Putin legitimized his war as a, a campaign against denazification, uh, among other things. So, I mean, th this is a huge issue and it's a spiritual issue, um, much more than anything. I would push back a little bit in the sense that like a polis exists for the good life. It almost has a kind of social contract quality to it of like, you know, we don't want a bad life or war of all against all. So we're going to kind of like get, get in, get with this polis so that we can thrive it almost sounds it has echoes of Jefferson or something. You don't get to choose your polis. You are born into a polis, and you can imbue it with a moral purpose if you are spiritual. But on some level, you are born into your identity, and it is not something you can choose. There is no social contract that you sign. Yeah, well, I don't um, think so, Aristotle was a ahead. social contract theorist. I, I don't. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the the way that it was expressed is almost kind of like lending us that. I mean, you can find obviously Plato's Republic is a large attempt to find the good and that you should pursue the good. And it's a political book, but it is ultimately about the good. You should pursue the good even if it does not benefit you in you but do, know, do you agree with, with, with Hegel that the state is the actualization of the ethical idea? Uh, I think it can be uh, after a that process of transformation. Yeah, that it should be. Yes. Yeah. Well, there. All right. Uh, please stand. But it doesn't by originate that... as such. It originates in. It originates like in the opening scene of two thousand and one or something, and it originates yeah, it, in violence. That's why it's important to have a structural theory and not just be an idealist. Right. All right, uh, please stand by, said Zelensky, actually fled to Poland. He's not standing and fighting. Um, is that, I, I saw something like that. Is that true? It's a lot of misinformation. I'm not sure, because I think it came from a Russian program. government source, so who yeah. knows. Um, Enlightened Despot said, uh, you can do all the statecraft you want. Feminism and its entrenched emotionalism is a serious impediment to sanity. It needs to be defanged first <laughs> or start watching the day after. Um, and he also said, what do you think of the notion sanctions arising from the invasion of Ukraine will hurt Europe and the US far worse than Russians that Putin is triggering late 60s or early 70s inflation? Um, well, it's definitely going to hurt Europe. Uh, it could potentially be good for the Americans if they radically react quickly and they get all their, they try to basically you know, radically reindustrialize and get all of the resources churning out and drop the kind of global warming thing for a bit and try and and yeah. replace, uh, you know, the role that the Russians played for the Europeans. Obviously, it would take some time, it would take like a, a decade to get everything together. Um, but in the meantime, the Europeans are going to suffer badly. 
Um, and it's 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 it, it feels kind of unlikely that the, this current uh, political elite in the Americans are really that reactive that they can pursue such a large structural reorganization very quickly. I think it's going to be a process that's going to have to play out over over some time. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think obviously we're seeing higher gas prices and and ga- um, petrol is just a basic commodity is almost like a, a, a proxy for just inflation in that sense. Um, uh, well, as I'm, th- I mean, look, it remains to be seen, but a- as I'm thinking about it, I-, I think there's a lot of deflationary pressure. I mean, not selling all of these products in Russia. Um, is deflationary. Um, I think bifurcating the world economy is deflationary. Um, so I, I'm going to reserve judgment on on all the economic implications of this. I it's I I'm I don't, I'm not sure yet. Also, on the original point about feminism, I just want to remark how weird it is to turn on like CNN or Fox News and have a woman telling me about warfare. It just feels like that really shouldn't be a thing. But okay, I mean, oh, it, it, it's so it's just it's just so weird. It's like it's like it's like female sports commentators. Like, what are you doing? Like, I don't want to hear your opinion about the football. Okay, like this is our all thing. right, Nick Fuentes. Whatever you <laughs> you don't feel like you, you like female sports saying, commentators, so. Richard. No, I get it. I Look, you're a rat these days. I, so. I get it. Yeah, I'm a rat fan these days. Yeah, I I I get what you're saying, but I'm I maybe <laughs> uh, maybe I think we should have a lighter touch on such issues. <laughs> <laughs> but no female sports commentators is a, that's a red line for me that's the, line. <laughs> when the wokeism has, has truly gone too far you're just gonna you just go to fly get on a hang glider and go over to russia the second you turn on the tube and there's some woman talking about soccer <laughs> yeah but you you wouldn't get it you didn't, you didn't see how bad the last world cup coverage was okay but uh jo- joshua larson said please do more debates keith this is hot stuff um, yeah, I, I don't like to actually uh, doing debates just for like the sake of blood sports, but I do think there, there's a couple of interesting ones. The next one I want to set up is Tyler Hamilton versus Adam Green on Christianity and the historicity of Jesus. I think that'd be an interesting one. So if I can should be watching that one. get Tyler on for that, that should be good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the last super chat. So yeah, if anyone sends any more, I'm probably not going to read them. So unless you just want to give me money. Um, Sir Leon said, Spencer, are you going to respond that since the Ukraine's ultimate goal is to join NATO and the EU, they aren't dying for their country, they're dying for McDonald's? <laughs> I, I I get it, but I, I think that's a gross misrepresentation. Uh, of the, they, they, they clearly don't, many in the country, now obviously in the East Donbass region, there are many people who genuinely want to be Russian. Many, and many, many in the country just don't want to be in a Russian economic system. They don't see NATO as just you're going to be force fed McDonald's. I mean, they they see it as protecting their homeland and kind of being being part of something bigger than themselves. So I, 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 I find it very distasteful to look at uh, Ukraine or the Russian soldiers who spill their blood for their country uh, with such contempt. I mean, regardless of the political situation, um, at the end of the day, they are patriots, and I think that's. That's yeah. worthy of of a, of a, of a you know. A yeah, there's reference. a there's a serious lack of honor of like I've even seen like nationalist channels sharing videos of like Russian invaders being like tortured or like um, you know because they're Chechens or whatever this kind of thing. It's very yeah, it's in very bad taste on either side. Yes. Like yes. treating it like a, a football sport, like a spectator sport. It's just yeah, um, yeah. There, there was actually a couple of late ones I'll read. Uh, <laughs> The fine Irishman said this debate is very much poll versus plebid. <laughs> I guess that's the, the politics section of Reddit. Um, and Eric Orwell said maybe what legitimated Rome was the Pax Romana, Richard. Yeah. Um, so I think what yeah, legitimate so the, the ultimate soft power is Pax Americana. Yeah. And it has been yeah, there. So I mean, we can bash America, but I mean, there's good aspects of this empire. The fact that we're having this discussion right now the fact that you can raise a family in in germany and so on i mean there there are good aspects of it and just to throw it away i, I think is reckless yeah so that's all the super chats um yeah this was a good discussion like i said really high viewership i got like 400 new subscribers or something i was seeing almost at 10k now so that's uh, that's great and uh, yeah i think the audience will will have gotten a lot from this it was a, an interesting discussion probably less 
of a debate and more of a discussion than people were mm -hmm. expecting. But uh, yeah, if either of you have any kind of closing statement or any parting shots, you can feel free to go ahead. I'm good, actually. Yeah, I'll just take the W then, and uh, we'll come with <laughs> <it. laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah, we'll let the audience decide that. And uh, yeah, take care, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.